Succeed in God's Way How to Succeed Without Losing Your Soul A book written by Goodhart Obi Akweme Narrated and produced by Onimisi Adaba Chapter 1 You have a great destiny For I know the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall seek for me with all your heart and I will be found of you saith the Lord and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you saith the Lord and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive This is from Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 11 to 14. I like the phrase expected end. It gives one hope for a desired outcome. It is fascinating to know that God created you for a definite destiny and purpose. You are not a biological accident that just happened by some romantic activity between a man and a woman. You didn't arrive on this earth by happenstance, mistake, chance or coincidence, no matter the circumstances of your birth. God made you with definite intention and for a specific purpose. Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6 reads, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. The psalmist perceives the awesomeness and majesty of God in the light of the frailty and corruption of humanity and wonders why God should be so mindful of him. He marvels, why is God thinking about man? Why is God's mind full of me? Why is he considering me and my ways? One truth I believe God wants to saturate your heart and spirit with is that you are a child of destiny. You are a child created and called by purpose, for purpose and on purpose. You're a child of God born in due season for definite reason. It wasn't by chance you were born in this day and age and not born in the days of the apostles or the patriarchs. You were born in this season because God fashioned you and wired you for such a time. No child brought himself or herself into the world. Every child is a divine assignment by God. Yes, there was a wink of the eye between the mother and the father, but no child would be formed in the womb of a woman without God's autonomous permission. As much as many parents desire to have their children, it is not by their might or by their power, it is by the sovereign summons and mandate of God. So never allow yourself to believe that anybody is a biological accident. If God did not step in along the line and cause your spirit to birth in the womb of your mother, you wouldn't be here. And interestingly, God knew you before your parents knew you. And not just that, before you had the opportunity to recognize yourself, God knew you. God knows you. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and before thou camest out of the womb I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations God fixed you in eternity he sorted you out and then sent you in time to fulfill the mandate he wrote concerning you You have to be like Jesus and declare that you have come in the volume of the book written concerning you to do the bidding of the Lord Your assignment in life is to discover chapter by chapter page by page line upon line what heaven has written concerning you and live it out God knew you before your parents knew themselves and each other it was God that used your parents to orchestrate your arrival into the world they were simply partners in fulfilling God's intention according to nature it is a great privilege a solemn honor given to parents to bring children into the world in partnership with God hence if you are a parent Part of the inheritance you ought to bequeath to your children is teaching them to discover their God-ordained pathways in life. That means you need to have enough confidence in God to say, "Whatever you will have my son or my daughter be in life, I release him or her to just be that." But too many times, parents have premeditated or preconceived ideas of what their sons or daughters should become in life. But how can you know more about God's child than God himself? How can you see the end of something of which you cannot tell the beginning? How can you see the end of something of which you cannot tell the beginning? 
You can't claim to know the destiny of a child if you don't know the origin of that child. You must be confident enough to release that child to God that sent him or her through you to fulfill destiny. The manufacturer of a thing most definitely knows the purpose of his product because he was guided by purpose in his production. Intentionally made A man of God says you enjoy dimensions of immortality when you are right in the middle of God's will for your life, when you are en route to fulfilling destiny. There is nothing the devil can do about your life or calling because God is for you as long as you are in the path he ordained for you. When you are in the center of God's will, doing what heaven wired you to do, nothing can take you out before your time. No accident, no coincidence, no witch, no wizard, no curse, no hex, no juju, no voodoo and no doo-doo can blow you out before your time. The psalmist said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. This is in Psalm 139 verse 14. It's amazing to see the level of precision and accuracy God took to fashion you. The Holy Bible says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. The value a manufacturer puts on a product is seen by the amount of precision he engages in producing it. Most vehicles coming in today are called precision equipment. The manufacturers took the time to make precisely the equipment needed to deliver according to well-articulated intentions. Indeed, these are human beings producing accurate programs, but the scripture shows that we are the fearfully and wonderfully made. Beloved, you are most valuable in the eyes of God. You are so valuable that the Bible tells us that God has not only counted the number of heads on earth, but has numbered the strands of hair on your head. So when you go to the salon, he knows the thousand and one strands on your hair that got trimmed off. He knows that because he is meticulously mindful of you. You are highly valuable. I don't care how many men try to devalue you, how they try to make you feel less of yourself, how your parents made you feel like the black sheep of the family in your upbringing and how some boy or some girl jilted you. It doesn't matter how relationships or problems have made you feel insignificant. In the eyes of God, you are most treasured. God created everything to function precisely. A man did not make you. You are only born by man. Hence, you are a product of the Almighty God, made in His image and likeness. God saw Himself when He made you. So never you allow what you have been through in life to devalue you. The psalmist had this understanding when he sang, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. This is in Psalm 139 verse 14. It doesn't matter what the 1000 Naira bill went through in life. It came from the central bank vault, went through the paymaster to the marketplace, then someone squeezed it. Someone threw it down and jumped on it until it looked dirty. But at the end of the day, when you spread out the 1000 Naira bill, it is still as valuable as it was before fellows tried to mess it up. No matter what you've gone through, you are still as valuable in the eyes of God as you were before the foundation of the world. You may have lost something along the way, but as far as God is concerned, you are still valuable in His sight. Think aright. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. This is in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. God has an expected end for you. The thoughts he has of you are geared towards bringing you to that expected end. God doesn't only have the target destiny or destination for you. He also thinks thoughts that will order your steps there. He creates ways and means that will inevitably get you to the expected end. God is for you and he's thinking good thoughts towards you. But it is not enough that the thinking of God is good towards you. In turn, you have to acknowledge and embrace God's thoughts concerning you. You can't think of yourself as a misfit, poor and afflicted or sick. Those are not the thoughts God has about you. When he thinks about you, he thinks power, joy, righteousness, peace, victory and lifting. The Bible says, Yea, let God be true, but every man be a liar. This is in Romans chapter 3 verse 4. The question is, the question is, whose report will you believe concerning you? Will you believe the report of God's word or the reports of men and the scorecard of experiences. Let your experiences be a lie. Let the reports of your examiner in school be a lie. Let the report of the doctor be a lie. Let the report of the jury be a lie. But let the report of Jehovah concerning you be true.
you have to train yourself to think God's thoughts. Consider for a moment, what thoughts are you entertaining about yourself? Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your thoughts ultimately determine what you become. You can't experience more than your thinking can accommodate. Your thoughts are your boundaries. Life outside the box begins with thinking out of the box. You will go places in your thoughts before you get there with your feet. Your thoughts determine your lot. A man's life is the totality of his cumulative thoughts. Take charge of your thinking. Let your thoughts be in line with the Word of God. After the new birth experience, one of the most important things a man can do for himself is to sit down and renew his mind with the Word of God, to detox himself of all thoughts that are averse to God's intents. Change your thinking with the Word of God. If God says it is possible, then it is possible. When the angel informed Mary that she was about to have a special baby, she said, Be it unto me according to your word. This is in Luke chapter 1 verse 38. That is the only thing that you shall say when God speaks the impossible things to you and gives you the impossible dreams. Let it be unto you, not according to your connections, salary, the promotion committee, savings, but according to the word of the Lord. Always ask yourself, what are my thoughts? Am I thinking of myself as God is thinking of me? He thinks you are the head and not the tail. He thinks you are beautiful and wonderfully made. You look in the mirror and think of yourself. This guy is ugly. But God says, you are beautiful. He says, whatever you lay your hands upon to do shall prosper. Agree with him. The path to self-discovery. Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 12 to 13 says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You have a glorious destiny in God, but your destiny has to be discovered by you. The word discover means to unveil of what is covered. When you unveil something, you did not make the thing. You only remove the veil that concealed it so as to make it manifest. Thus, destiny is to be discovered and not made. Furthermore, destiny is found, not on the streets. You have to seek after aid from the author of life. He says, You shall seek me and you will find me when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. This is in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. So, it takes your all to discover that he is all for you. Destiny is not something you find casually. It's an all-important search because living does not begin until you have discovered destiny. Before you discover destiny, you may be existing just as a number in census records, but you only begin to live life when you discover why you are here. God says, Then shall ye call upon me. Who does the calling? You. Ye shall seek me. Who does the seeking? You. And ye shall find me. Find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. It is time for you to discover who you are. You are not whom people said. You are not even whom you think you are. You may have summed up your life in your assessment by your progress graph that at the age of 70, you can't be worth more than this or that. You have plotted when you will get married, have your kids and build your house. But these are human computations. You ought to go to God and ask Him, Who am I? God rewards you with fulfillment as you discover and pursue His agenda for your life. Nothing fulfills and satisfies in life other than the discovery, pursuit and fulfillment of destiny. The word fulfill means feel full. It's a sense of fullness and completeness. The Bible says you are complete, not in things, not on the job, not in marriage, not in having kids, but ye are complete in Him. This is in Colossians chapter 2 verse 10. Just like water is to fish and air is to birds, so is God to your fulfillment and completeness. The place. There's a place called the place. Certain things won't blossom, flourish or thrive in your life until you are planted in the place. God spoke to prophet Elijah, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. This is in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 4. The place is God's venue of commanded blessings. You need to get there. Life continues to be an exercise in futility until you get there. And you are not there until you get there. And when you are there, Everybody will know because things begin to fall onto you, as the Bible says in Psalm 16 verse 6, in pleasant places.
your enemies will end up celebrating you because you are in the place that is called there, the zone of divine presence and supernatural providence. Dealing with Challenges The Bible says that God's commandments are not grievous. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. This is in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 and Matthew chapter 11, verse 30. When you are in the place called there, God puts upon your shoulders the burden of the word and that burden is easy. In that place, you learn from Him day by day and seek His way concerning your life. It is not every open door that is from God. Some open doors are simply traps of the enemy and on the other side of some open doors is destruction. Don't run through the door of a seeming opportunity, new job or relationship and fail to ask God what is behind the door. All that glitter is not gold, they say. It is not every potential relationship that should be entered into. Always let God take the lead. David hardly lost any battle because he was always a man of inquiry. He would ask God, Are we to go up to battle? If we were to go up in battle, in what way and by what means? Don't be presumptuous. Ask the Lord such questions as, What is your strategy? What is your battle plan? What are you saying, Lord? The objective is that you want to know not what he said in the past, but what he is saying now. However, it is not necessarily every frustration or challenge you face that is attributable to being off destiny's course. For instance, some people have heard that being off the right path leads to frustration and so each time they face a little challenge on the job, they wonder, maybe God didn't call me here. No, that may not be the case. When you are on the path of destiny, challenges are not burdensome because there is grace to handle them. What might have stopped others becomes for you a stepping stone to move to the next level. However, don't assume that finding destiny and purpose is just a stroll in the park. There are bumps along the way. There are curves, twists and turns along the path. But the beautiful thing is, you know that God is with you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? This is in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Joseph went through all kinds of twists but he was not deterred from fulfilling purpose. The pit couldn't stop him. Potiphar's wife couldn't derail him. And of course, the prison couldn't block his access to his God-ordained throne. The Power of Choice It is your choices and decisions that ultimately determine whether you get to God's destiny or not. God respects your choices and decisions. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. God cannot force your decisions, but he desires that you choose blessings and life. Life is all about choices. Where you are today is a product of your choices made yesterday. If you don't like today, change your choices today. Don't complain, because if you complain and do nothing, tomorrow will still perpetuate the status quo. Somebody said, we form good habits and then good habits form us. You have to change your bad habits to make good habits and let those good habits recondition you. Your choices and decisions determine what kind of destiny you ultimately attain. As much as God has a glorious destination for you, you need to be mindful that the enemy also has plans and his plans are anything that takes you out of God's plans. Satan strives to pull you out of destiny's course. However, the Bible says a curse does not come without a cause. This is in Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2. It is only when you break the hedge that the serpent can bite. It is only when you make room for the enemy that he can torment you. This is reflected in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 8. Shed the weights. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We have a race that is set before us. That is evident. But we cannot run the race effectively if we are carrying weights. Weights are inhibitions that slow us down on the pathway to fulfilling destiny. Weight may not necessarily be a sin, but a hindrance. If you are about to get on a 100-meter dash 
and you put on a suit and carry a briefcase, you are carrying excess luggage for a race for which you ought to be dressed light. It takes determination to lay aside excess luggage like pride, envy, malice, jealousy, greed, covetousness, anger and the likes. Their excess luggage, standing as inhibitions to our running our race effectively and efficiently. Hence the Bible says, lay aside every weight. Apart from the weight, some sins need to be laid aside. As we lay aside the weight and the sins, we need to run the race and finish it. It is not something you do overnight. Like the camel, you have to learn to drink plenty of water, for the journey is great. You need resilience, stamina and staying power so you don't step out of line. A Time to Every Purpose The things that God has shown you today are not necessarily going to be fulfilled today. So as we talk about destiny, we must also talk about the issue of timing. Timing is of utmost importance in fulfilling destiny. The Bible admonishes us in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2 to be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The two ingredients we need to inherit every promise are faith and patience. Has God given you a promise or a prophetic word? Wait for it. It will come to pass. Don't compromise. Wait for it. Be patient. Prophecy is time sensitive. It will come to pass in due season. You don't have to cheat to make it come to pass. If God said it, He is committed to bringing it to pass in His time. No greatness begins great. It is the devil that starts from the top and takes you down. If you are going to go up in life, you must be willing not to despise the days of little beginnings. The multi-billion dollar company started with an intangible idea. It began small. It is not at every closed door that you have to cry. There are some closed doors you ought to look back at and say, Thank you, Lord, for that closed door. Because if some doors were not shut, you would not see the door of destiny that was opened. You might have had to lose some jobs to get to where you are now. Perhaps before you began your business, you had to lose your job. Heaven did that for you because some open doors are traps of hell. One grace I have enjoyed for a good number of years is the understanding that slow and steady wins the race. Kenneth E. Hagen once said that God told him that it is better to be behind schedule than to be beyond schedule. If you are beyond schedule, you won't be seeing me anymore. But if you are behind schedule, you will be seeing me. I am only at a distance. It is better you are behind schedule than beyond schedule because once you go ahead of God, you don't see God anymore. You are leading yourself. But if he told you to move and for some reason you hesitated, at least you are still seeing him in front of you and you can say, Help me, Lord. Have mercy. Apostle Paul testified in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. We all have a course. We are all in the race. And our assignments are not just to start, but to finish strong. God has a destiny for us, but there is a time-paced path that leads us to the destination. The Path of Life Psalm 16 verse 11 reads, Thou wilt show me the path of life. Thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. There is a path of life that leads to a glorious destiny. Ask God to show you the path that would lead to the destiny he has for you. Oftentimes the pathways to destiny is straight and narrow and the pathways to destruction, which is the enemy's path, is broad and wide. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 to 14 that the broad way leads to destruction. Also in Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 it reads, There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Lot looked up and he saw a lush land that looked good. Little did he know that Sodom was doomed to destruction. He lost his wife and all he had labored for by that sensual move. This is captured in Genesis chapter 13, 18 and 19. You have to tell God from time to time, You give me your choice. I don't want to choose after the flesh. I don't want to choose a job that looks plump. It is not necessarily the big contract that looks juicy that God wants you to go into. It's not necessarily the job that pays more that God wants you to go for. It may be so, but not necessarily. You have to ask God, where did you pre-cut my destiny before I was born? Where did you predestine my blessings? Show me, Lord. I have little respect for those who celebrate success after seeing success and I have great respect for those that believe that something is going somewhere even before it shows up. 
Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 6 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The word predestined means to appoint or to determine beforehand. So, God has appointed, pre-cut, and predetermined you in advance. You have a great destiny. Chapter 2 Discover Your Purpose For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall seek for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. This is from Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 11 to 14. On my way out of church service one day, a particular man I had known for about 10 years accosted me, and as his custom had been for the 10 years I had known him, he reached out his hand in demand for a monetary gift, to which I obliged, as I had been doing all those 10 years. As I handed the money over to him, my heart went out for him, that for close to 10 years he had been at that same station of life where he was continually dependent on people. I believed things could turn around for him, and he could become useful, productive and self-sustaining with the help of God. What I saw in the life of that man was nothing but a disconnection from destiny. I realized that many times people are asking for what they think they need instead of what they truly need. It is one thing for somebody to give you a fish that can last you just a moment. Once the meal is over, it is over. But it is another thing for one to sit you down and teach you the strategies and technicalities of becoming a fisherman such that whenever you are hungry or you require fish, you know exactly what to do. What you need to know is how to cast your net into the ocean on the spot on side at the right time to catch your fish. There is a sense of fulfillment that bursts forth in your innermost being when you catch your fish. It's a double treat, the joy of catching the fish and the pleasure of the bowl of pepper soup. Enjoy your inheritance. You will never come into the pathway of the fulfillment of your God-ordained destiny until you discover why you and go on to pursue it. Until you discover that purpose, your life will only be a futile exercise filled with struggles and frustrations. Living begins when a man or woman has discovered the answer to the question of why me. When you answer that primary question of your life, all other secondary needs are met. Psalm 16 verses 5 to 6 reads, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and my cup. Thou maintainest my lot, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a godly heritage. Even though you and I have an inheritance in God, that inheritance can only be made available and revealed to us when we get on the pathway that guarantees its release. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. This is in Psalm 16 verse 11. So there's an inheritance in God, no doubt about that. If you are a child of God, there are certain blessings and inheritances that God has both reserved and preserved for you. But it is not enough for you to have reserved blessings. We know we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is according to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. That's the truth. But as far as you live in the earth terrain, spiritual blessings cannot be profitable to you. They must be drawn down. Your bank credit remains in the bank's vault. It only impacts on your well-being by making withdrawals into your purse. I haven't seen a man who is satisfied with marrying a spiritual wife. I haven't seen a man who is satisfied with driving a spiritual car. And haven't seen a man who is so connected with the realm of the spirit that he is content to receive a spiritual salary. I believe that the blessings God has made available in the realm of the spirit also need to be translated into the natural. There is no denying the truth that we are blessed 
but we must seek means to have the translation of those spiritual blessings into concrete tangibility until those blessings become visible in nature to people around you and even yourself you cannot witness them not only should you declare by faith that the lord is good but you also have to come to the point of tasting and experiencing the tangible goodness of the lord in the land of the living i believe that henceforth you will not only declare that god is good but you will also be a benefactor or recipient of the goodness of the lord your life shall no longer be a question mark and men shall no longer wonder at your life and ask are you truly serving the true and living god god is good there is a good life but there is a good path that leads to it and unless you get on that pathway that is called the good way you will not experience the good life god is eternally good he is completely and unapologetically good there is no evil in god everything he does is good james chapter 1 verse 17 says Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning. God is good by nature. There is no evil in him. God cannot be tempted with evil and he does not tempt any man with evil. There is a place of abundance in God. There is a place that is beyond just enough. There is a place that is beyond barely getting along. There is a place called excess. Its premise is described as good measures pressed down shaking together and running over this is in luke chapter 6 verse 38 the bible says in ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 that god is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us he is able not just to do but also to surpass our expectations and imaginations to levels that blow our minds in direct proportion to the power at work within us God seeks to bring you and me to the realm of the overflow, the realm of abundance. We must understand that life will always offer us choices. Time and again, you will have a choice between a broad and a wide way of life and the straight and narrow way. The broad ways in life are oftentimes the paths of least resistance that seems acceptable and appealing to the flesh or the natural man. It is a place you will move into and receive the applause and accolades of multitudes of men. a place fitting for the natural man and there are many that go therein but there's another way that is straight and narrow and when men begin to step on that path they immediately become a target of criticism people will criticize you laugh at you and mock you because the straight and narrow way is one that is not popular it is a path unacceptable to the natural man it is never too late to change your direction in life i don't care how old you are or how far you have gone It is never too late to discover fresh the reason for your being. Abraham began his journey of destiny at 70 plus age. At 85, Caleb was still vibrant with strength, declaring, "Give me this mountain." This is in Joshua chapter 14 verse 12. The same mountain he had seen 40 years before. So it is never late to start. It is better to be late and get it done than to be the late without doing it. That means it is better to begin late. than to die and never be gone the earlier you embrace the responsibility of discovering why me the sooner you fulfill destiny the transition period anyone who is going to embark on the journey of fulfilling god's plan must be ready to accept criticisms from family friends and colleagues because you will never receive the majority vote of mankind when you are pursuing god's plan for your life the beautiful thing about pursuing purpose however is that eventually The word God has spoken over your life will blossom to the amazement and admiration of men. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 it reads, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. What a paradox. The vision has a voice, not at the beginning. It means at the end. The mockers will celebrate the vision and those who laughed at you at the beginning will laugh with you. It seems to me that prophet Habakkuk was wise at switching between the time zones of the natural and spiritual, showing that when God gives you a prophetic word, the word is time sensitive. It is for an appointed time. Many times we receive the word of prophecy and it is so clear in our mind. The picture is so bright in the spirit and we think today is the day of fulfillment. When Moses heard that his God-ordained mandate was to be and serve as a deliverer for the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, he thought it was that day. He delivered an Israelite from assault by slaying an Egyptian. 
Apostle Peter, referring to his incidents in Acts chapter 7 verse 24 says, Moses supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand will deliver them. That overzealous step sent him on 40 years exile until God's appointed time. 40 years later, Joseph had a dream of greatness and he thought that the dream would come to pass instantly. There's a time in between anointing and appointing. It is called transition. Between the time God spoke a word to you and the time the word comes to fulfillment and manifestation, there's a waiting period. But the wait is not for you to look around. The wait is to keep you focused on the end. Hold that picture crystal clear in your mind so that no matter what you go through in time, you will not be discouraged from pursuing it. In the end, it will speak. When you look at natural realities, it looks like your destiny is delaying, but it cannot be denied by any gang up of hell. When Prophet Ezekiel was in the valley of the dry bones and was asked, Son of man, can these bones live? Very wisely he replied to God, O God, thou knowest. Then God said to him, Prophesy. We read that he prophesied as he was commanded, and as he did so, things began to happen. First of all, there was a rumbling, a noise and a shaking, and then the bones came together bone to bone. This is found in Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 7. When God has declared over you a great destiny, you must not allow the noise and the rumblings that follow to deter you from pressing on to see the performance. Truth is, after the noise and rumblings, the bones are coming together, bone to bone. What you thought should have been an overnight fulfillment of what God told you might have taken some time by now, but every word that God spoke to you, he will surely bring to pass. Wait for it. Joseph, after he received the divine revelation of his destiny, thought that he would end up in the palace overnight. Yet, he went through bits of bumps, turns, and twists on the way. It wasn't that God couldn't pick him up from where he was and take him to the throne in one quick sweep. But that is not his modus operandi. Stop wondering, why do I need to go through all I'm going through to get to the throne? The pit is too dark. The slavery is harrowing and humbling. Even the prison is stinking. Hold on, beloved. All those are procedures and stepping stones to the palace. If you won't go through them, you won't get to the throne. The joy of childbirth strengthens a mother to go through the birth pangs graciously. Put on a gracious attitude. The word of God said concerning Joseph, Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. This is in Psalm 105 verse 19. God's word to you is time bound. Has God shown you a vision of a great husband, a great anointing, great doctor, great lawyer, great politician, and what have you? He gives you that word, but allows the process of time to prepare you for the prepared place. Joseph had to go through the school of hard knocks. Otherwise, he would have gotten to the palace bitter and vengeful. The grace in the words of Joseph to his brothers reveals the deep work of grace that God has wrought in him between his experience from the pit to the palace. The Bible records in Genesis chapter 45 verses 4 to 8, the message translation. Come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. They came closer. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But don't feel badly. Don't blame yourselves for selling me. God was behind it. God sent me here ahead of you to save lives. There has been a famine in the land now for two years. The famine will continue for five more years neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me here to pave a way and make sure there was a remnant in the land to save your lives in an amazing act of deliverance. So you see, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. He set me in place as father to Pharaoh, put me in charge of his personal affairs and made me ruler of all Egypt. Only a man who has been processed through the fire and ridden of bitterness can speak like Joseph. If you're going to step into the fullness of what God has for you, you must be wary of bitterness. You must forgo the pains that others have caused you because God is going to elevate you, not to take advantage of the elevation to punish those who at one point was used by the enemy to bring pain. God is going to elevate you in such a way that you can return without any form of bitterness and in love to rescue those who were used by the enemy to hurt you. The very essence of exaltation is for you to minister grace back to others. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10 verse 8, Freely you have received, freely give. A man who doesn't know that he has received freely will not know how to give back to others graciously. How good would it be if we learn to treat others the way God treats us? 
with the same grace, patience, long suffering. He believes against all odds that we will turn out better some day. He trusts that no matter where we are today, our future is bright. If only we could maintain that attitude with other people, our world would be a better place, and more so, our churches will be a glorious testament of love to the world. Stop hoarding and start giving. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You are God's masterpiece. You are one in town. When God got through making you, he threw away the mold and ensured that he would not make one exactly like you again. You might have an identical twin, but that one cannot be exactly like you. Certain things distinguish you from other people on the face of the earth. Isn't it a great honor and privilege that you are among the six billion people on the face of the earth that God knows? You are not just a statistical figure. You are unique and peculiar, not because of anything you have done to qualify, but because his nature is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. This is in 1 John chapter 4 verse 8. Also in 1 John chapter 4 verse 16 it reads, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. He made you and me to share himself and his authority on earth. The Bible says we are made for his pleasure. You are not made to live for your preferences. There is a reversal somewhere. We are packaged to find pleasure, peace and fulfillment as we please him. There is a space in this life that only you can occupy. There is a contribution to this life that only you can make. There are roles and assignments that only you can play and perform. God has not called us to become consumers. Rather, He's called us to become distributors and contributors to lives and people who have a sense of value and know that they have something to offer. Too many people are saddled with the spirit of grabbing and taking. Unfortunately, such people become victims of society. They are always thinking that they are needy and as long as they consider themselves so, they will always have needs. Some people have resources and properties, but they are still poor because the things they acquired have not been able to satisfy the spirit of poverty within them. It is that spirit that makes government functionaries, especially on the African continent, to steal and amass wealth for themselves even when they have enough to feed their generations. The fear that one day they may not have the wealth anymore strengthens their need mentality, pushing them to always get more by all means. It's obvious that all fingers are not equal and we don't have the same backgrounds. But your background isn't as important as your future. Where God is taking you is far more important than where you have been. In pursuit of destiny, don't fix your gaze on the rear mirror. God called you to look ahead through the windscreen. Many times we are driving to our destiny but our concentration is on the rear mirror. That's our past and we end up not making progress or running off the track. Stop looking back and sulking over your past. No matter what you have lost in terms of opportunities and resources, you still have all it takes to achieve all that God has designed for you. Your experiences will work together for your good as you embrace God's love and pursue His purpose for your life. In Revelations chapter 3, verse 2, we are charged to strengthen the things which remain. No matter what the enemy is trying to plunder, abuse, misuse or steal from you, there is still something remaining. There is still value within you. There is still something you can offer to mankind that the enemy cannot tamper with. You are not here to occupy space. You are alive because there is a reason for your life. You are not just alive because God didn't know what to do with you. You are destined for something that only you can do and achieve. Start with what you have. It is by stepping out to make yourself available for kingdom service that you begin to discover the reason for your being in more specific terms. The church is the ideal place to discover your destiny and purpose. There are many people in the local church today who never knew they could do what they are doing. A wide array of contemporary artists and professionals have the foundation of their great careers in some church somewhere. The administrators, organizers and leaders did not know they had those abilities within them until they began to make available to God the little they knew they had. You can't afford to be idle in the church. Idle men don't discover their purpose but those who are working or involved in service. In the process of serving, God makes clearer your reason for living. There's always a baseline. Begin with something you have. The prophet spoke to the widow asking, 
What is in your house? Shifred said there was nothing, then added, Save for a pot of oil. This is in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 2. God will not do the miraculous without what he has already given you. What God already gave you is the starting point for your next miracle. There's a miracle in your hand. There's a miracle in your voice. There's a miracle in your heart. There's a miracle in your house. There's something God put there. If you take it back to him, he will multiply it, amplify it and make it a miracle for you. Psalm 37 verses 3 and 4 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The Bible says whatever your hand finds doing, do it with all your might. Do it well. Do something with what God has placed in your hands. You don't master it if you don't do something with it. You don't perfect the act until you practice it. There will be the occasions for mistakes, occasions for tripping, occasions for falling, but keep at it. If a parent was so afraid of the child falling over himself and kept stopping the child from tripping, the child will never walk. The parent has to let the child trip over now and then and then support the child till he walks. It is the same thing with God. God gives us perimeters to falter, trip and fall. You may not do it properly, but God celebrates the fact that you stood up to do it. You may not be the best option, but the fact that you are available in the hands of God is a sacrifice acceptable to Him. You may not be the most articulate intercessor, but because you make your time available, God honors that sacrifice. And in time, the anointing and spirit will be caught because you are available. Oftentimes, God makes able the available. He equips the available. If the truth be told, many of us have become better at things we are doing today because we practiced. We began somewhere. There are starting points and learning curves. You haven't always been this good at things you do today. You haven't always driven as well as you do today. You haven't always managed your business the way you do today. There is a starting point. You don't need to pray about your life partner if you are on course. It's not a prayer point. If you are on course with destiny, you don't need to pray for the next job. It's not a struggle. I met my wife while walking the part of my destiny, preaching and serving God. Don't be discouraged by anyone's unbelief. Have the mind to pursue your course and you will meet the right people at the right time. You will find that the lines will fall for you in pleasant places. Your prayer every day should be, Lord, order my steps this day. Let me be in the right place at the right time. If the truth is told, the best things that happen in your life haven't resulted from your hard work. They were divine coincidences. They were by providence. May God cause your ears to remain ever sensitive to his prompting and to his leading. How to discover your destiny Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 reads, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. There are eight simple keys to discovering or identifying your destiny. There is nobody's destiny that is preferred over another. But we have the responsibility of discovering and pursuing our destiny. In no particular order, let's consider the keys. 1. Identify your real heart's desire. One question to be asked is, what is your real heart's desire for your life? If you can process that question, you are on the pathway to discovering why you. This is often a pointer to your destiny. Many times, God has hidden within us desires that we don't even know. But when God begins to allow us to pass through certain pathways, He begins to reveal to us that there is a certain craving for this or that thing. The real desire for your life is a pointer to your destiny. Why you? Also, the moment you begin to serve others, you begin to discover things that God has put within you as your real inner desires. 2. Identify your second nature. You need to identify what is second nature to you. This consists of your natural gifts and talents, what comes naturally and easily to you, what you enjoy doing without struggles. Do you like to sing? Do you like to play the keyboard? Do you have a flair for writing? What is second nature to you? What are your gifts and talents? The answer to these questions is a pointer to your God-ordained destiny. Do you know why those things are called hobbies that are not your work? They should in reality become your job. Identify the things you do joyfully without consideration for being rewarded. Do you love to cook, knit, design, build, help 
Or do you find yourself going out of your way to just show compassion to others? What would you do joyfully if you were not going to be paid for it? It's a clue to your destiny path. Identify your gifts and talents, and when you do, don't trade them in the house of the Lord. Your gift, as far as the house of the Lord is concerned, is to be used for service, as an avenue for worship. The church is a place to hone your gift, and having been exercised in the house of the Lord, your gift yields profit outside in the marketplace. Don't fall into the trap of the enemy to merchandise your gift in God's house. The Bible says that a man's gift makes room for him. You don't make room for your gift. Let the gift make room for you. 3. Identify what stirs your passion. What stirs your passion or zeal? It was said concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 2, verse 17, that the zeal of the Lord's house had eaten him up. What are you ready to die for? What are you passionate and excited about? If you walk into the house and disorder irritates you, it could be a pointer to the path of your destiny. If you are put off when a singer goes off key, it could be a pointer to your destiny. Whatever irritates you or makes you uncomfortable is a pointer to what you are called to fix. Somebody spoke to me some time ago making observations concerning an area of ministry. I replied, this is a brilliant observation, really vivid. Many people have overlooked this issue you raised and it just might be a pointer to what God has called you to resolve in his body. Don't be a part of the problem, be a solution. Too many people observe and criticize but do nothing to change the situation. You on the other side, pointing fingers at others, try crossing over to their side and you will see that it is not quite that easy. 4. Be attentive to the Holy Spirit. What witness is the Holy Spirit bearing with your human spirit? The Bible says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Also, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is in John chapter 10, verse 27. The psalmist in Psalm 95, verse 7 and 100, verse 3 says, We are the sheep of his pasture. So we are wired to hear the voice of the Spirit of God. Hearing the voice of the Holy Ghost is not the exclusive preserve of some spiritual juggernauts. It is for all who are saved. It is not a special gift. If you are a sheep and not a goat, you have a spiritual hearing aid. So you have to ask yourself, what is the Holy Spirit bearing witness in my heart about? The Holy Spirit can guide into the purpose of God for your life. 5. What can you commit yourself to finish? Ask yourself what you can give all of yourself to fulfill. Some good starters are poor finishers. We need to ask God for the finisher's anointing so that we may not only start well, but finish well too. What can you give yourself 100% to fulfilling? It is a pointer to your God-ordained destiny. 6. Identify your areas of faithfulness. In what areas of your life are you currently bearing fruit? What is working? What is blossoming? You know fruit comes from a tree, so the areas of your fruitfulness are a pointer to what tree you are. If you are bearing mango fruits, it is an express pointer that you are a mango tree. If you experience ease in communicating ideas, it could be that you are a public speaker, a preacher or motivational speaker, just something in the direction of using your mouth. What is naturally blossoming in your life shows the tree you are and is a true pointer to your God-ordained destiny. We must come to the point where we are no longer going to our workplace with fear and trembling. We must come to that lane where we move from working for a living to living for and enjoying the work we do. We must discover what God has called us to do as our life's assignment and pursue it. Let me add that sometimes in trying to fulfill your destiny, you may have to settle for an initial pay cut for an ultimate pay rise. The challenge with many people is that they are too engrossed with temporal gratification over long-term fulfillment. They are satisfied with a job that pays their bills but leaves them with empty hearts at month end. They go out tired and return tired. They somehow know, I am not fulfilled on this assignment. This is not the best place God has for me. There's that nagging feeling within that, perhaps I'm misplaced. Perhaps I'm a misfit here. But if I leave here, then what next? Frankly, it is a legitimate concern, but if you are going to maximize your life to let everything God has poured into you come to manifestation, there must be a time in your life when you undergo a pay cut for an ultimate pay rise. It is something that has to happen someday, sometime, and it is better late than never. 
The quicker you switch and make that decision and brace yourself to go all the way with destiny, the easier for you to see the best that God has for you. The best days are only just starting. His inheritance is found in the good path. 7. Seek Godly Counsel Seek counsel from mature Christian leaders before you take a major step. The Bible in Proverbs chapter 11 verse 14 says, In the multitude of counselors there is safety. Sometimes people leave their jobs before they tell their pastors or a church leader and three months down the road they are asking the man of God what happened. They should ask you what happened. Seek counsel. Man of God, I sense a nudging in my heart to move in this area. What do you think? Do you see me blossom and bear fruit in this area? Do you think that I am at the right timing now? In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. 8. The Peace Test Follow the umpire of peace in your heart. Let peace be your guide and your governor. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to they which also are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Whenever God speaks, God will speak peaceably. He won't speak to bring such confusion and fear. Your mind may take some time to catch up, but deep down, there ought to be stillness. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 says, This is the way to go. Follow it. Don't confuse the umpire of peace in your heart with your mind playing catch up. As long as you follow destiny, your mind will ask you questions like, Are you sure? The truth is, you'll never be 100% sure. You just have to walk by faith if you're following God. You never have it all together in your mind, but there ought to be something that settles it within you. Faith is a risk, but an insured one. It is insured by the blood of the Lamb, and it is insured by God Himself. If you're stepping out to walk on water with the word that God gave you, you're not in truth walking on water. You're walking on the word that God gave you. Chapter 3 Get your house in order. As the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one. And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. This is taken from Genesis chapter 2 verses 18 to 25. Also from the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 to 33, it reads, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. God of Order and Excellence Our God is a God of order. Everything he does, he does with a sense of order. He doesn't do anything chaotically. 
Paul said that much in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Whether you believe it or not, God is attracted to order. Not only is our God attracted to order, but His blessings are also attracted to order too. Conversely, a life of chaos, disorder, rancor or strife repels His presence and blessings. I have said here and there, and I'll say again, that you can organize the devil out of your life. The reason is, when your life is ordered, there is no room for the enemy to interfere. The enemy moves amid chaos and is himself the father of chaos. He is the progenitor of rancor and chaos. So whenever he sees chaos, it attracts and invites him. Furthermore, God is a God of excellence. Wherever you see excellence manifested, it is a type and shadow of God. His spirit is a spirit of excellence. He alone is most excellent and we have to strive to come to a point, as his people, where we go beyond mediocrity, living the average life and just living like the rest. We are not called to live like the normal average man. We are called to glory and excellence, as reflected in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Continuous Improvement There ought to be something within your spirit that challenges you to become better than you are today, if you are a child of God. The Spirit of God ought to impress upon you that your life is more than where you are today. You feel and know that you can do more, have more and become more. You can become a mover and shaker in your field of endeavor even if you feel as if you're in the pit right now. Don't let people conclude on you when God hasn't concluded with you yet. Don't put a full stop where destiny has only appended a comma. The comma means pause, think about it, reflect, meditate and get your breath together because the journey is not over. But full stop means this is all about your finances, marriage, your relationship and career. But the devil is a liar. The Bible tells me that God has a volume of books concerning each of us. This is in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7. The book about you is the word of life. Whenever you go to the word of life, you discover the things that God has made available for you that you are yet to experience. But keep on living. Keep on walking and keep on winning, for you will get there in a matter of time. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18 says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Keep living. By destiny, no day is permitted to be less glorious than the previous. As a child of the living God, you are not called to confirm to the status quo. You are called by God to be a changer. I am a Nigerian and there is this thing they call the Nigerian factor, used as an excuse to be ungodly. Rough driving, taking bribes, rude speech and other vices peculiar to our climb are all excused by the Nigerian factor. But the devil is a liar. Every country and community have some common ungodly practices that even Christians copy with the excuse of, after all, everybody is doing it. You are not called to be everybody. The Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says you have been called out of darkness to stand out from the crowd. You are called out to the spotlight to be a spectacle, a sign and a wonder to your generation. You are called to do something different from the norm. You are not to go with the bandwagon effect. You are not to go with the multitude. You are called by God to be different. God is inseminating you or getting you pregnant with the truth of his word that will raise a new breed out of you who will establish his will on earth. I believe you and I are part of that new breed. The church, the body of Christ, is in her finest hour thus far. We are at the greatest moment of opportunity because light makes the most sense during Stygian darkness. You don't see the beauty of headlamps in the daytime, but by nightfall, you see the light very clearly because the light shines bright in the darkness. You are in your greatest opportunity if you are a saint. The Bible says that unbelievers will grab saints in these last days and demand to know God for themselves as a result of the mark of exemption upon them. This is in Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23. Prophet Isaiah also said in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. There will be so much breakdown tragedy and adversity on the earth and it will take knowing the Lord to triumph. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. 
Get ready, church. If the church is going to step into her glorious moment, her moment of destiny, there must be a combination of preparation and opportunity. Yes, it is the church's time, but the church must be ready. We can't drop the baton when the baton enters our hand. We must be prepared. Before a prince is made a king, he goes through schooling. Everything about you must be for what God is about to do. Your business must be in order. Your family, home and finances must be in order. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. This is from Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13. After the fall in the garden, it has always been the Father's desire that the earth is restored to divine order. And he is saying the responsibility is on the church, not on the judiciary, executive or legislator of a country. It is not on the United Nations either. The church, not the heathen, will change the world. We can and we must. If we don't, our children will ask us questions. We can't leave this world as it is for our children and grandchildren. There must be something better to offer them. Have you noticed in scripture that God never asked the world to change? In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it reads, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Our economy is a reflection of the church. The natural is the outlook of the spiritual. What you see in the corridors of power is just a reflection of the church's state. We are buying and selling, jostling for positions, titles and the spotlight. But God is waiting for us as the church to take the lead, to be an ark, a haven of safety like Noah built. People shall run into the church and find safety. They shall find bread in the church. The adage, as poor as a church rat, should become obsolete. The Bible says we shall lend to nations and not borrow. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 6. Money bags shouldn't decide what pastors preach. We won't preach to suit the so-called big givers. Enough of lily-livered, watered-down sermons. The church empowers people in their chosen paths of endeavor. We are to produce the best in every sphere because we carry the seed of the blessed one, the most excellent one. Daniel was ten times wiser than his classmates because of the Spirit of God that was upon him. He had knowledge of witty inventions. By that same Spirit, your thinking becomes profound and razor sharp, for you have the mind of Christ, as put in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. We have celebrated mediocrity for too long in the church. We shall invest well in everything we do in church. Let our music be top quality. Let our audiovisuals be excellent. Let there be a touch of excellence in running our programs. Some say it's wasteful because it's earthly and the money should be given to the poor. But Jesus said we can always give to the poor because they will always be here with us. But our best must always be reserved for him. As reflected in the book of John chapter 12 verses 1 to 8. There is nothing you invest in worshipping God that is wasteful. He is a first class God. He deserves nothing but first class worship with all of our skills, competences, networks, connections, know-hows, strength, health, wealth, etc. The beauty of relationships. God never designed for man to live in isolation. God never designed for you to live aloof and alone. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 records, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helpmate for him. This scripture has often been applied in the marriage context, but we can also use it appropriately outside of marriage. It is not good for a person to be alone. You must seek to have relationships of note in your life. If God says it is not good, then it is not good. The psalmist says, God setteth the solitary in families. This is in Psalm 68 verse 6. The Apostle Paul spoke of the church within the context of relationship. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Solomon in his wisdom addresses the same issue. He says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if the four, 
one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he had not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And the threefold cord is not quickly broken. This is in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 to 12. Nobody is supposed to stand alone. He that stands alone falls alone. God deliberately brings certain relationships into your life to complement you and help you fulfill your destiny. In other words, God brings people into your life to supply the missing piece in the puzzle of your destiny. You may be praying to God about something he has sent the answer long ago, but it did not come to you like you thought it would. It came in form of a person God brought your way. And by the way, that colleague, friend, student or acquaintance might just be the key to your next level. Be careful how you treat people. When opportunities show up, they don't show up looking like prospects. The person who begged you for money might have been the introduction to your miracle. God might be using him or her to access your capacity to handle the next blessing he is willing to release to you. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. This is in Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 to 3. You know, they say men marry women for who they are, hoping they remain the same, while women marry men for who they will be, even hoping to change them. But we all know people are just who they are, and only God can change a person from inside out. Anyone who will not respect and appreciate what they see should not even be with you. You can't use faith to manipulate people. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 to 3, the message translation reads, Stay on good terms with each other, held together by love. Be ready with a meal or a bed when it's needed. Why, some have extended hospitality to angels without ever knowing it. Regard prisoners as if you were in prison with them. Look on victims of abuse as if what happened to them had happened to you. Remember Naaman, Syria's army general who was a leper? The link to his healing was his housemaid, as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 1 to 2. Your driver or cleaner could be the ladder you need for your next breakthrough. Don't treat relationships God brings into your life shabbily. They don't always have to be headed for marriage. There is a purpose for every friendship, an assignment for every relationship. Define it and maximize it. Chapter 4 Don't let death stop you. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 7 reads, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise and go over to the Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. And I, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn out from the right hand or the left hand, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. They are strategies for possessing your possession, and Joshua is the book of inheritance, a useful guide for the believer. It is a classic illustration of God's strategy for bringing his people into their rightful place in him. This is no longer the bondage of Egypt, or the dreariness of the wilderness. Israel was gradually beginning to enter the land God had promised, not even them, but their forefathers. God had told Abraham, who was then Abram, in Genesis chapter 15 verses 13 to 14, saying, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, 
and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. The book of Joshua essentially shows the fulfillment of this promise. It is noteworthy that firstly, God keeps his promises, and secondly, the best of every believer is always ahead of him. So when next someone says, Happy birthday to you, they are saying you are beginning to experience the beginning of the very best days of your life. Your best is ahead of you. God always reserves the best for the last. Sadly, too many people are weighed down by what has happened already in their lives. They gripe and complain, but what they fail to realize is that what has happened is insignificant compared to what is about to happen. There is always more. This is a prophetic word. Something has happened, something is happening, and something awesome is about to happen. God is out to constantly outdo himself in your life. The book of Philippians chapter 3 verses 13 to 14 reads, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the higher calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul, writing here, understood that everything that God had done through him, in him and with him in the past was history. God doesn't give stale manna. He gives fresh manna every waking morning. He doesn't give you yesterday's manna today. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 68 verse 19, He daily loads us with benefits. God is doing something new every day to keep you refreshed and revived every moment. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. This is in Obadiah chapter 1 verse 17. Upon Mount Zion, three things happen. Deliverance, holiness, and possession. Before possession, there must be a period of transition that prepares you. The transition period is the required time or season for building holiness. Then you will possess your possession. That means you can have possessions you are not possessing. That is the point where you are delivered from bondage. But there is yet a transition between being delivered from and being delivered into. There is a transition between deliverance from Egypt, that's from bondage, sin, poverty and lack, and delivery into Canaan, that's righteousness, peace, abundance and joy. Psalm 2 verse 8 reads, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. There are certain things you need to do to take custody of what God has made available to you. It is possible to have some believers who cannot possess their possessions. One thing that is necessary to possess your possession is to press. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 12, it reads, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence take it by force. The way to possess your possession is to take it forcefully, and if God is saying there's a need for you to take your possession forcefully, that means something is contending, trying to stand between what God has already made available for you. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 verse 14, I press towards the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In pressing forward, you are to forget yesterday, whatever it represents to you, with its strengths and trials and triumphs. Press. This is the strategy for possessing your inheritance. Don't stay in the wilderness. It is one thing for a believer to be delivered out of Egypt, but it is another thing for you to be delivered into Canaan. Everybody leaves Egypt when it is time. Everybody gets out of the dominion of darkness with ease because Jesus paid the price once and for all for everybody. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that leaves no room for prejudice. When it's time to get into Canaan, a specific strategy is required. Are you stuck in the wilderness? Your wilderness is not so much physical as it is spiritual. You may have been delivered from sin but are not quite righteous yet. You are not battered and you are not yet financially stable. You are no longer afflicted with disease, but you don't enjoy wholeness either. You are out of Egypt, but still in the wilderness, in between and betwixt, in the place of transition. God always brings us out of Egypt with the intention that he will bring us into our Canaan. But not everybody gets into Canaan. And I'm talking about spirit-filled believers. They are not in Egypt, they are sanctified, but they are not enjoying the fullness of redemption. Yes, they have possessions in God. 
for God will never bring you out of Egypt and abandon you in the wilderness. However, between your Egypt and Canaan is some place called wilderness, a place of transition where you get broken and shed unnecessary weights. There you are purified and prepared for the land of promise. The purpose of the wilderness. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 1 to 3. It's not enough for you to tell the Lord, I love you, I will keep your commandments. He wants to see you go through a situation where you are tested. He has to see you humbled and pressed so your heart will be revealed. Then he will prove your love for him. He took his friend Abram through the same test of commitment and Abram passed the ultimate test having to offer up his son, his only child. At the end of the test, God himself attested to Abraham as being completely sold out to him. This is reflected in Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 to 12. God isn't fooled by our lip service. We say we'll do certain things for him, but when the temperature and pressure changes, we renege on our commitment and fail to do what we said we will do. When you promise to pay your tithe if you get a billion dollar contract, he'll test you, not by hearing your voice, but by creating a scenario where you have only a tiny fraction of that. He wants to see proof of your faithfulness in small things before bigger things. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. This is no kindergarten truth. It's strong meat for the mature. Have you been through certain situations that you know undoubtedly have humiliated you? Some young people promise to keep their bodies pure for marriage when they want God to give them a spouse. Yet, just six months into the relationship, they begin to fondle and mess around with the body. God is testing the consecration you prayed for years or months ago. When one sugar daddy or mommy offers you money for your body, it's time to prove your vow and consecration. It's time to stand up to the test. If you dodge the test, you dodge the testimony. If you escape the trial, you escape the triumph. There is a divine purpose for your wilderness situation of hunger, loneliness, delay, denial, joblessness, lack of admission and all of that. There is a divine agenda for your wilderness. There is a purpose in your pain. Submit to God and resist the devil. Wear Satan out and he will flee from you. It takes a high discipline of a son to say, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As reflected in Luke chapter 22 verse 42. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 16, it says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy later end? Don't panic and don't pretend. God has a purpose for your wilderness. You see, in the wilderness God gives you just enough. Some folks complain when all they have is just enough. Just enough to go to work and back just enough to go to church and back, just enough to feed and clothe. But it is always enough anyway. It's just a test, so don't panic. You just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, as reflected in Exodus chapter 14 verse 13. You are either in or out of the wilderness. Don't pretend to be out when you are still in. Stay there and endure till the end. The wilderness is when faithfulness has to be at its zenith. When your commitment to the word, prayer and the work of the Lord has to be at their peaks, you have to put in more effort, tenacity, passion and more zeal. Don't let failure attack your heart. Don't let a little success or breakthrough get into your head. Don't eat your seed with your bread. Don't spend money at a level that will get you broke. You'll be digging your own grave for an untimely death. What God has given you in the wilderness is just enough and much of it should be converted into seed. Invest in your future. Pay your dues. Don't eat up your future. Pay your tithe. And by paying your tithe, tell God, I know this is my seed time. Harvest will come. Those who compare themselves with others are unwise. 
Why would you want to eat your future today? If you can't afford a thing today, then let it go and let God get it to you in his own way and time. If it is not in your account or your pocket, it is an indication that it is not yet time. Live life well today. Don't leave before your time. John the Baptist was in the wilderness until his time for revelation. Elizabeth conceived the child at the fullness of time. There is a fullness of time. When you appear on the scene at the fullness of your time, everything will be ready. For instance, when I was appointed a pastor in a new city several years ago, on the first day, I had three instrumentalists waiting for me in the morning service. Also, the hall and leaders were waiting for me. In fact, I remember how one man walked up to me and whispered, Pastor, I want to be your worker. He became a consistent worker. There is a full season to start your business. There is a full season to start your ministry. Don't go before your time. Many people want to start their firm or ministry and they run off on their own before their time and get into trouble. Stay in training till it's time. Pour water on the hand of your Elijah and the same anointing, oil, grace, favor, skill on his head will begin to rest on your head. There's a level you get to that you are willing to accept what God brings your way. You're just so willing and obedient that you can say to God, If this car is a car that I'm going to drive for the next five years, so be it. If this is a husband or wife you have given me from heaven, then so be it, regardless of my preferences. Let your will be done, not mine. That's a son talking, not a child. The Bible says the government shall rest upon the shoulders of sons. This is in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. The entire earth awaits in eagerness for the anticipation and the manifestation, not of the children of God that drink breast milk, but of the sons of God, men who have developed spiritual muscles and are stable. They have gone through the wilderness. The devil tried to destroy them with hunger, but they said, No, I will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God breathes on your few clothes and they never wear out. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is reflected in Psalm 118 verse 23. Tested and Trusted The instruments that God is about to release into the world from the end-time church will come out smoking with the glory of the Lord from the wilderness because they have been well tested. They have gone through the furnace, tragedies, adversities and hazards, but they came out with the divine seal of sonship. They have nothing to fear anymore because they have been through the valley of the shadow of death. They have known the Father's love practically and their faith has withstood trials. Psalm 66 verses 10 to 12 reads, For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidst affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. When gold goes through furnace, it comes out purified. The Bible says in Psalm 12 verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. God's word is tested and proven. You may have been tested and failed, but you need to get up again and go on. It may not be immediately, because he will give you time to recuperate and fortify yourself. But watch out, you will be tested again. Before the promotion comes, there will always be a test. God is no respecter of persons, but he respects his principles. The test comes before promotion. Now understand that Psalm 66 verses 10 to 12 is written in the permissive sense, not causative. God doesn't cause those things. He only permits them. He permits them and also regulates them to the degree of which he has given you grace to handle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, it says, They have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. That means in that tragedy, God wants to show you Jesus, who he is, the way, the truth and the life, as reflected in John chapter 14 verse 6. In that situation of hunger, God wants to show you Jesus, the bread of life. Job 14.14 14 says, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Hold on to Jesus, for your change is coming. Come into your wealthy place. The fierceness of trials is such that it takes you into your wealthy place. Men will say you are wealthy, but you feel you are still down. 
At this point, you can't even feel what they see because you have been so humble. You won't want to think so highly of yourself. You are riding the limousine, but it feels as though you were riding in a beetle car. You are flying your jet, but it feels like a passenger flight. You have been through so much that nothing on the outside matters much anymore. That is why you see men who are so loaded but have been through hell. They still walk with that self-effacing demeanor. There is simply no room for pride. Personal Accountability In the wilderness, everyone becomes individually accountable. It is no longer collective. That's why the ten spies who said the children of Israel couldn't possess the land got punished along with the whole congregation. While the two spies who said yes to possessing the land led the new generation into the land. In this life, what you see inside is what you get. Whether or not you believe doesn't change God at all. It changes you. There are some struggles, frustrations, difficult moments, challenges and battles that every believer eventually goes through. And it's not because of their sins, but simply because they are growing up. Before a young boy starts growing teeth, he starts spitting and crying often because he is growing up. A girl's metabolism is altered when she is near or into teenage and it makes her uncomfortable, but she is growing up. So there is often discomfort that comes with growing up. But it is not the same thing as the discomfort that comes because of sin. One is avoidable, the other is not avoidable because it is necessary and preparatory for the next phase. How could the Bible say, all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Why? Is it wrong to be righteous? Is God dissuading us from living right? What's he saying? He's simply telling us what to expect when we live right. You attract many things into your life when you live right and they are not all pleasant. The method of God is very interesting. God expects you to see the opportunities which the persecutions bring. When you are punished for doing the right thing, the Spirit of glory and God resteth upon you. This is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. Death opens a new phase. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. This is recorded in Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. There is life after death. You may be going through pain, but there is after the death. You may be going through difficulty, but there is after the death. You may be going through tempest, hell and high water, but there is an after the death. After the death of Moses, God said to his servant Joshua, It is time to get up and cross the Jordan. There are certain voices you don't hear until after the death of something in your life. There is a word you won't hear from God until certain things have died in your life. Weakness has got to die. The disease has got to die. Infirmity has got to die. Strife and malice have got to die. Jealousy has got to die. There is something in your life that is so precious to you and your life is tied to just like the life of Joshua was tied to the life of Moses. But when its purpose expires, it has to go. The person or thing may be so precious to you but there has to be a separation because you can never be on two different levels at the same time in your life. You have to be willing to exit your yesterday to be able to move into your future. Life is made up of exits and entries. You leave one phase to enter another phase. So, death is not what people think it's all about. Death is simply the closure of yesterday and the initiation of the future. Certain things have to go for you to press into your future. Your past has to be buried. Your yesteryears have to be buried so that God can bring you into your future. God is raising a new breed of leaders in the body of Christ. People come in with a new system of doing church to usher us into a new era. The mosaic order is dying. There has to be a Joshua. New generational leaders who will take the baton from old Moses and take the people of God from their past into their future, from the old order into the new order. God said in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 9, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Also, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, it reads, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. That means he's closing the former phase and opening up a new phase. Joshua's preoccupation is with strategies for taking cities and nations for God. Moses was preoccupied with building God a tabernacle in the wilderness, and there was nothing wrong with that insofar as they were going to be in the wilderness. 
There was nothing wrong with Moses, but God had another man for the assignment of taking his people from the wilderness into Canaan. God's New Strategy If we were able to study the book of Joshua and capture the divine strategy God gave him for taking cities and nations for God, we would employ and apply similar strategies today. God is no longer talking about church. God is talking about cities, nations and kingdoms. He says in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We are talking about nations of the world in our time, not as they were in times past. We can't use Stone Age strategies for the Jet Age. We need fresh wisdom for today. Man lives not by the word that proceeded, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, as reflected in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. You see, we must always be attuned to the Spirit and not be stuck in our programs and patterns, which are not bad. But many times, we're so organized as to organize the Holy Ghost out of our meetings. We shut the door on Him with our itineraries and schedules because we forget He is the Lord and we are not. We have to adjust our system to accommodate and release ourselves for the move of the Spirit of God. God is a moving God. He's never stagnant, never stationary or static. He moves you from point A to point B. One of the indications that God is with you is that He has been moving you. It is not how far He has moved you, but that He moved you. That's why after a while, you have to pause and look back and see where God has brought you from and say, Thank you, Jesus. I am not where I was three months ago, six months ago, one year ago, or even two years ago. You have moved me. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let death stop you. Don't let the wilderness stop you. Chapter 5 Keep the dream alive And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. This is in Genesis chapter 13 verses 14 to 18. When I was in secondary school or high school, there were some folks we called NFA, meaning no future ambition. Such people typically had no regard for time. They were up for anything and everything. They were known to lack focus. They were the ne'er-do-wells, usually at the bottom of the grades. We called them defenders of the class, like the defense in a soccer team. That lifestyle often went beyond the four walls of the school and they turned out as failures. Created to rest and flourish I believe that God did not design your life to be without focus, direction and cause. Man was the last handiwork of God and finally... He said his work was very good. This is in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. That tells us that man was the peak, climax and the zenith of the creation of God. God kept you for the last. He ensured the sun, moon, stars, land, sea, animals, vegetation and fish were there before he brought you to the scene. He made man on the sixth day and rested on the seventh day. That means your first day of existence was the day of rest. You were born into God's rest. You are a child of purpose. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God designed you to succeed, thrive, flourish and excel. He created you to reign on earth. God ordained that we should walk in good works before we were created and before the earth was made. You are his handiwork to produce good works. Now, if God knew you before you were in existence and had predetermined you to end well, you ought to have no fear about your destiny and your future. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He is committed not only to the beginning, 
but finishing his good work in you. He is not a God of abandoned projects. The same God who laid the foundation of your life will put a crown on your life and your destiny. I challenge you not to settle for less than God has designed for you. Don't settle at barely getting a long lane. You are more than average. God designed you to dwell in the place of abundance, excess, plenty and increase. Don't settle for less. Creator to serve. There is a thin line between ambition and vision. God intends for us to be a people of vision and foresight who have dreams and are going somewhere to happen. Ambition is man's willingness to do things for man, but vision is God doing something through you for somebody else. Ambition focuses on self, but vision goes beyond you and focuses on others. So the vision God gives you is not just for your benefit, but primarily for someone else's benefit. God designed us to be a people of vision. Ambitious people seek to be served. They struggle for authority and they are self-seeking. People of vision, on the other hand, do not seek to be served, but to serve others. They are people who understand that their lives are nothing but the extension of the graciousness of God here on earth. They understand that their hands are extensions of the hands of God on earth. Their bank accounts are channels of God's resources on earth, and everything they have in their possession are willed completely to God as an instrument to be a blessing to their generation. God is desirous to raise such visionary people. It is self-destructive to be a person of ambition. This immediately brings to mind a man called Absalom, one of the sons of David. Filled with ambition, he swelled within himself and desired what his father had. His ambition eventually led him down the path of self-destruction. Visionaries understand that their lives are given to be a contribution to other people's lives, that they live to give themselves to the well-being of others. Your life is not valued by your number of years, but in your level of impact on others. We're called to be light and salt to the world. God measures your life by the degree that you can impact somebody else's life wherever you go, whether in the marketplace, office, business, politics, academics, or wherever. You ought to be a person who makes positive impacts. The nations of the world will not be changed by politicians, but by God chasers who are willing to give all it takes to get the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven. They may be in the minority now, but along the way, there will be a deluge of followers who will subscribe to the mandate. Order brings vision to fruition. I remember when Jesus was going to feed the 5,000. One of the first things he had said to his disciples was to tell the people to sit down. Not just to sit haphazardly, but to sit down in order. In companies of 50 and 100. Only then did he initiate the miraculous. When there is order and protocol, and we understand that God is not chaotic, but he is a God of decency, then our faith will become productive. Beyond the jumping, clapping, speaking in tongues, or laying on of hands on a day-to-day -day basis, the Christ-like fragrance ought to show in our operating in order and decorum. First fruits, the foretaste of what God is about to do in your life. However your steps or how you order your life, determine if you are going to in reality walk in greatness. If you are going to operate in and enjoy greatness, you must have a vision. A sneak peek into what God has in store and then align yourself for the actualization of it. Vision is not the same thing as manifestation, but the vision is a seed. Without the seed, there can be no harvest. In other words, what you haven't seen, you can't walk into. Relationships are in phases. God spoke to Abram after Lot had left him. Sometimes God waits for some relationships in your life to be severed before he raises you to the next level. It's not that Abram wasn't blessed up to this point. He was blessed, so blessed that Lot his nephew was also blessed by being with him, to the point that both men's herdsmen began to struggle over grazing space. They were far more blessed than they could handle, but it was time for God to lift Abram to the next devil, and God had to sever that relationship because it couldn't enter the next phase of blessing with Abram. There are people in your life today who will not make it into your next devil of blessings, that is why you must never complain when people leave your life. It could be as a result of misdeeds or they simply left in unexplainable circumstances. Don't complain. It might just be a lot that God is severing from you. It's not that they are bad people either. It's just that their phase in your life is over and they must move on. I tell people my assignment as senior pastor is simply to be a bus driver and I know some passengers will not necessarily go all the way to my final destination. So when you get to the point where you will disembark, you say, Driver, stop. 
I want to get down here. There's nothing wrong with you getting down if you know it's your bus stop. The driver doesn't cry or complain because somebody got down. He simply understands that they got off according to the dictates of destinies. Some people left your life in yesteryears. You cried or even still crying over them. Please understand that they simply got off at their bus stops. If some relationships were not severed from you, you would not be in the one you're in now. There are some relationships you're in right now that are deterring you from stepping into the ones that God has in store for you. The vision God gives you is the seed of the harvest in store for you. Without the seed, there can be no harvest. That is why after you have received the vision, a picture of the future from the Lord, you have to hold fast to it because that in itself is the seed that will bring forth fruit in your great destiny. Seek God for clear vision. The enemy seeks to steal the vision God has given to you or at least blur the vision. He'll try to make you doubt what God said to you, making you begin to wonder whether God truly said what you heard him say. At the time God spoke, it was so strong and clear, your soul was vibrant. But months and years down the road, it seems that the passion has begun to slip through your fingers. Now you are wondering if God really made that promise and whether that prophecy was real. The whole intention of the enemy is to blur the vision and once he blurs the vision, you can't rise with passion to pursue it. The brighter the vision in your heart, the faster its fulfillment. The clearer the vision, the quicker you accomplish it. God understood that Abraham needed a booster for what he had spoken to him. So he showed him a vision of the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. The idea was to implant the vision of Abraham's prophetic destiny in his mind. Genesis 15 chapter 1 reads, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You can't receive a vision of your destiny except you go to the one who made you, your creator. Nobody knows you like your maker. Even you don't know yourself as your maker knows you. You were wired for a particular assignment. You were formed for your role in life and you are engineered by your manufacturer to be effective at what he has called you to be. Your true identity can only be discovered with your maker. You know, it's almost as if God got through making every one of us and took one last piece of the puzzle away and said, you will not be complete until you get back to me. Hence, it is as we get back to know God that we begin to know who we are. As we know Him, we know ourselves too. When your vertical relationship with God is right, He will cause the horizontal to be right too. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with Him. There's a dimension of your intimacy with your walk with God that causes all your horizontal relationships to blossom. It is not about making peace with your enemy. It is walking closely with God that causes everything around you to work together in your favor. As you begin to draw nigh to God and pursue Him with great hunger and thirst, you will see Him cause everything around you to fall in place, line upon line, as ordained by God. You carry seeds of greatness within you. These seeds need to be discovered, unraveled, unfolded and revealed. There is something inside of you crying and begging to be unveiled. You're going somewhere in life to happen. At every point in time in your life, you'll always be much more than meets the eye. At every point in your life, there will be something that is yet to be expressed. It is called potential. God always seeks to do more, to increase, enlarge, and multiply you. The Seed of Greatness It is that seed of greatness within you that constantly cries out for more. It cries out for you to improve yourself making you dissatisfied with where you are per time. You are blessed. Food is upon your table. They shelter over your head. God has blessed you with marriage and children. But somehow, something on the inside tells you that there is much more to life than you have experienced already. It is called the seed of greatness. The Bible speaks concerning Isaac that in the same year of famine, he sowed and reaped a hundredfold, such that the natives envied him as he became greater and more prosperous. This is recorded in Genesis chapter 26 verses 1 to 6 and verses 12 to 17. There is an expression of greatness that causes men to pay attention to what God is doing in your life. It will not be so much about what you are doing, but what God is doing in your life. People will look at you and all you will have to say to them is, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. 
This is also reflected in Psalm 118 verse 23. Greatness is what assures and reassures you that you can always do much more. You can always have much more. You can always be much more and you can always perform much more. It is the seed of greatness. I particularly like what Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 verses 13 to 14. It reads, There is one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the higher calling of God in Christ. Many times in our past experiences, whether positive or negative, that stops us from moving into our future. You have to learn to let go of your past experiences. Your past success can be the enemy of your present success. Someone said, the greatest enemy of the best is not the bad, but the good. The good can be the enemy of the best. Many times we move from bad to good and become complacent, failing to understand that beyond the good, there is still the best. Don't settle for less than God has for you. God designed for you to make the news, break records and break out on all sides. God designed for you to pull out of every form of limitation to become the head and above only. Containment is not the same thing as contentment. God designed for us to be content at the level he takes us to. But God did not ask us to be contained in any level. The enemy attempts to contain us, to confine us within a particular perimeter. He says stuff like, Thus far you can go and no further. Nobody in your generation saw beyond this. Who do you think you are? But tell the devil that in your seed you will change the operations of your generation. You will break out from the pattern of your generation because you are carrying the seed of Elohim, the seed of greatness. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 reads, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. You carry the seed of greatness. The best of your life is still in front of you. Your best is yet to come. The new is here. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. This is in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18. There is always a next level. Let go of the past losses, past failures, past delays and past denials and press on to what God has in store for you. There is much more in your future that you have seen in your past. God makes all things new. In Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19 it reads, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God will cause rivers in the desert, in the dry and parched lands where men are thirsty. He will open channels of water to come forth. He knows how to make all things new. But he says you must forget the old things first. Sometimes we ought to pray for specific amnesia, for grace to forget the past. Too many times we carry dead things from the past into the present and so pollute and frustrate God's plan for our destiny. Your past is the enemy of your future. Your past is not you anymore. You are a new man or woman in Christ. In Revelations chapter 21 verse 5, God said, Behold, I make all things new. God is making your finances new again. He's making your health new again. He's making the love in your marriage new again. He's making the success in your work new again. He's making your academics new again. He's making your ministry new again. He wants to give you a new lease of life. Let your past be past. Smith Wigglesworth said, I am a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. How true. God is risen up to a thousand dimension. Feed your dream. 1 John chapter 4 verse 4 reads, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The greater one is on your inside. Anytime you are encumbered with the pressures of life, remind the adversary that the greater one is in you. He is greater than all the enemy can bring your way. It is not the environment that determines your outcome in life. As far as God is concerned, it is what is within you that will determine your outcome in life. We are not of the people who live by the dictates of the environment or climatic condition. We are designed by God to change the environment. When you understand that the greater one resides within you, you will rise above every negative situation around you. Joseph was a man of great dreams, a lad of 17 years, 
He dreamt of greatness, kingship and dominion. He was so intoxicated with the vision God gave him that no negative situation around him was able to confuse him about who he knew he was. You are not who men say you are. You are who God says you are. Nobody but your maker has the right to define you. Nobody can call you the name your father hasn't called you. He said you are above only and not beneath. He said you are the head and not the tail. He said you are a success and not a failure. He said you are the epitome of health and not sickness. He named you. Joseph was so drunk on the dream God gave him that nothing around him was strong enough to make him change his mind. His dream got his brothers so angry that they threw him into a pit. But even the pit was not powerful enough and not dark enough to make him change his mind. There is still a king in me, Joseph said in the pit. From the pit, he became a slave boy and the negative conditions of slavery was not strong enough to make him trade off his dream. Right there as a slave boy, until he got to the throne, he kept telling himself, There is a king in me. God designed you to do certain things that only you can do. You were wired for your task. Nobody else can do what God has called you to do. When he finished making you, he threw away your mold. He couldn't make you again. I want to declare to you that you are the handiwork of God, a work of perfection, goodness and greatness. Joseph didn't let himself be confused even one bit about who he was. Rather, he changed the environment by announcing his dreams. And when you're a dreamer or visionary, men will laugh at you, but keep dreaming. Dreamers don't die easily. Dream is proof of possibility. People may laugh at your dream. Men will doubt and despise your convictions. But God is all you need to birth the concept he stirs up in your spirit. Whenever God gives a vision, he makes sure there is provision for it. The fact that he gives you a vision is indicative that there is provision somewhere. Count on him. That somebody is thirsty means there is water somewhere. That you desire to be clothed means there is clothing somewhere. The fact that you have a passion for something means that there is fulfillment somewhere. The fact that you desire to be married means there is a spouse somewhere. The fact that you want to drive means there is a car for you somewhere. The vision is proof that there is provision somewhere. Go for it. Greatness is not something we are trying to force out of the hands of God. God has already worked it into us as a seed. You are not trying to be great. You are not trying to succeed and you are not trying to prosper. You are not trying to make it in life. You are not struggling to attain some high and lofty goals. If you can see it in the dream bank of God's word, it is available and attainable. The Holy Bible is a compilation of possibilities. Your discovery of the truth guarantees your recovery of destiny. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 8 verse 32 that the knowledge of the truth makes you free. Psalm 71 verse 21 says, Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Indeed, greatness is comforting. God will increase your greatness. He is not against greatness. He gave us the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, and His assignment is to make life comfortable for us. Whatever you call comfortable is the Holy Spirit's assignment. His assignment is to increase you, enlarge and multiply your greatness. We read in Genesis 12 that Papa Abraham was blessed, and not just for the sake of being blessed, the Bible says he was blessed to be a blessing. That's the catch. Understand the purpose of being blessed. If we are going to walk in the greatness that God has for us, we must be kingdom-minded people. A people who understand that everything God is bringing our way are not for us per se, but for the kingdom of God. We must be a people who understand that we are called by God to be vessels and conduit pipes of his blessings, channeling his blessings to all men. We are not to become wells that trap the blessings. We are people who allow the river to flow through us. When the tap is open, the water flows. But when the tap is closed, even though there is water in the system, it can't flow. Too many people have failed to understand that the way to go to the next level of blessing is to open the tap. Don't close the tap. That's why the Bible says in Acts chapter 20 verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The word blessed means empowered. Giving empowers you to multiply, amplify, grow and increase. Understand that nothing you let go of goes away. It goes into your future and your destiny. Keep your eyes on Him. We have to change our concept of what giving is. 
given is not God taken from you. Rather, it is God creating an opportunity for divine exchange to draw what he has in his hands. You can't keep what you have in your hand and at the same time receive what he has. At every point in time, what God has is always bigger and better than what you have. It is not all about you. It's about the kingdom. I find one common thing among great men across the globe. They are people of dreams, always talking about the future. There is always something that drives them. When it looks like they are coming to the fulfillment of one vision, another one is born. People of greatness are people of great compelling and motivating dreams. Your dream excites you even when you should be discouraged. This is why people who don't have dreams easily get discouraged. They have nothing to live for, no future or hope to strengthen them in what they are going through. The moment you stop dreaming, you stop living. There are people alive who are simply existing. God will never allow you to fulfill all the vision He gives you. The moment you get to what seems to be a goalpost, He moves it forward so that you will always be in pursuit of Him, always chasing what He has. And when He gives you what He has on one level, He moves forward. He waits to see whether you will be fixated on the present level or you will discover that there is much more in His hand and leave what He has given you and yet pursue Him. It is God's method of causing us to pursue him. The psalmist says in Psalm 42 verse 1, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. We ought to long for him, for he owns the things we seek. Jesus had a dream. The Bible says the joy ahead of him, not behind him, empowered him to endure, not enjoy the cross. This is recorded in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. There must be something ahead of you that motivates you to move into your future. Where do you see yourself in the next 5 or 10 years? You have to allow that thought to marinate your mind. Let it become a part of you so that everything contrary to it can't discourage you from entering into your future. Give him a call. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. This is in Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. Our calling is what initiates his showing. If you don't have a vision for your future yet, all you need to do is to ask him, Who am I? What did you make me to be, do, achieve or accomplish? Surely I'm not going to die small. Lord, who am I? He said he will not only answer you, but also show you. And the things God shows you are not easy to forget. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The enemy seeks to steal or at least blow the dream, so keep that dream alive in your heart and feed it with the word of God. It's a seed and needs to be watered. I always see a picture of my dream in the office, on my computer, on the wall. It is so real. Pick up the things God has shown you, begin to speak them, call them forth. I see a bright future. I see greatness more than meets the eye. God will increase me, he will enlarge me, and he will cause my enemies to see what he is doing in my life. Those who laughed at you will laugh with you. Your dreams will come true. Chapter 6 Rejoice in God's mercy. Although the fig trees shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olives shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my in high places. This is in Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 17 to 19. Life is not only a mystery, but also a gift. With the attempt of medical science and inventions to help human life, man has not been able to invent life. Life remains a mystery to man. It remains a mystery how a man's seed is conceived in the womb of a woman and that seed grows in nine months and comes forth like a baby, a full human being, alive. It's simply a mystery. Rejoice in the mercy of God. Life has its origin in God 
and can only be sustained by God. Just like the fish has its natural habitat in water, the birds in the air, so do men have their natural habitat in God. The Bible says, It is in Him we live and move and have our being. This is in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Life becomes questionable when we are outside God. Each time you see people alive, it is further proof that God is faithful. You are not alive by your own power, competence or right doing. You are alive by the mercy of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 reads, Who being the brightest of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. God, through his son Jesus Christ, upholds all things by his power. He sustains your joy, peace and health. Everyone standing today, numbered amongst the living, is doing so by the grace and mercy of Almighty God. Thus, it behoves us to give constant praise and thanks, not as something we do once in a while, but as our lifestyle. Each time you declare that the Lord is good and his mercies endures forever, you are living out the very reason God made you. God did not make you to occupy space, but to give him pleasure. It is truly because of the mercies of our God that we are not consumed. The scripture shows that his mercies over our lives are new every waking morning. It is a joy to know that every day you stomp your feet upon the ground is a brand new day and God has surely deposited brand new mercies into your account. Every day comes with its unique challenges and trials, but God says with each unique day's challenge, he will deposit enough blessings, enough grace, and enough mercy for you to overcome the day's challenges. The Bible in Psalm 68 verse 19 says God daily loads us with benefits. There is something about God. His timing is not the same as man's timing. Some persons think that it takes God a long time to bring to pass every word of prophecy he spoke into our lives. But that is not so for us. For one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with men. This is recorded in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. That's why every day you are up on your feet from your bed, you should declare, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. As recorded in Psalm 118 verse 24. In consonance with people, God made days. He made times and seasons for you. Don't let the enemy steal the blessings and joy God has set for every today. Make up your mind that nobody is going to stand in your way to receiving the blessings God has for you each day. Refuse to be denied your blessings because of the offense at your mistreatment by others. Don't fall for the trick of the enemy. You never know when God will bring the turnaround, so keep your heart full of the joy of the Lord. Psalm 133 verses 1 to 3 reads, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like a precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life evermore. The Bible also says in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 30, One shall chase a thousand, and two shall make ten thousand flee. This is why we go to church. There is something about the corporate anointing, corporate blessing, and the coming together of the people in harmony and unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Blessing is commanded when we come together as a corporate entity. Don't let the enemy rob you of that opportunity of blessing. In Psalm 103 verses 11 to 12, it says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. As believers, we need to celebrate and speak of the mercies of God over our lives. Every victory and testimony we have ever enjoyed are traceable to the triumph of mercy. It wasn't your strength or ability that triumphed. The mercy of the Lord triumphed in your situation. Any good thing in your life is attributable to the mercy and grace of God. Each time we celebrate and rejoice over the mercy of God, we begin to touch the very heart of God, the very heartbeat of God and the essence of God. Let fresh breath enter you. The Bible called David a man after God's heart. One thing we know of David is that he worshipped and praised God habitually. In Psalm 55 verse 17, it says, Evening and morning and at noon 
I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Also in Psalm 119 verse 164, it says, Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. Then in Psalm 34 verse 1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Also in Psalm 18 verse 49, it says, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, amongst the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. In situations that didn't seem right, David knew if only I get God into my situation, he will turn my darkness into light. When I go through a bad day, the one person I need is not some powerful noble or dignitary. The only person I need to step into my dark day is the Lord. He knew the way to beckon on God is not just prayer. For when you pray aright, God will answer and send angels to answer you. But when you praise, God is about shifting from his throne and moving into your situation. Psalm 22 verse 3 says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. The word inhabit means to reside. To reside is to abide, and to abide is to live. As you praise, God is about shifting his abode from the throne of grace and getting down into your space, no matter how bad it is. If God steps in, he turns it around. I don't know what your case is, but God is turning it around for you. You are about to receive a makeover. He is pumping into you the fresh dew of the morning. He is giving you new dreams and new hopes that will not be cut short or disappointed. I believe our Father is blowing His wind upon us. In the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel chapter 37, we see that the prophet Ezekiel prophesied. The wind blew as he called for breath to fill the bones, and there arose a strong and mighty army. The breath refers to the wind of God, the anointing of God, and the Spirit of God. The Bible says in Job chapter 32 verse 8, There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration, that's the breath or the wind of the Almighty, gives them understanding. When the Spirit of God lays hold on your spirit, He will strengthen not just your spirit, but also your body. In Romans chapter 8 verse 11, it says, But if the Spirit, that's the wind or breath of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Right now, you're being quickened in your inner man. Your visions, dreams, and your hopes are coming alive. You need to hold fast to what God said he will do in your life and determine like Jacob, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. As recorded in Genesis chapter 32 verse 26, I like Jacob. He knew how to wrestle his way until he was blessed. I won't let you go until you bless me. That must be your attitude right now and through your lifetime. God will indeed bless you, for the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. There must be something in you that says, No, enough is enough. Lean on God's unfailing mercy. Mercy and compassion are the core of the heart of the Father God. God is not power. He is not miracles, signs and wonders either. He does them, but they are not who He is. When you touch his mercy, you've touched the essence of his being. In Psalm 145 verses 8 to 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. When a container is full of something, it means there is no room for anything else. You are who or what you are full of. So the psalmist says that God is full of compassion slow to anger and of great mercy. God is not power. God is not miracles. God is not faith. God is not the wonders. God is compassion. God is mercy. When you begin to touch mercy, you are touching the essence of God. God is not in any way against us. God is for us. God is not only for us. God is with us. God is not only with us. God is in us. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This is in James chapter 1 verse 17. He doesn't change his mind about his nature. The Bible says his gift and his callings upon your life are irrevocable. In Romans chapter 11 verse 29, there is nothing you can or will do that will make God change his mind about his call upon your life. You may choose not to fulfill it, but you are still called. No day will he say, I'm taking my name from you. 
You may not live following his dictates to enjoy the fruit and the blessings thereof. But the day you wake up to the reality of the call of God upon your life, God is waiting to pour blessings on you. If anybody shifted, you are the one that shifted. If anybody moved away, it wasn't God that left you. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. In Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 to 6, he is the same yesterday, today and forever. As recorded in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, the Bible also says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. He was merciful in the Old Testament and he's still merciful today. God can't do evil. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12 verse 10, The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So when the devil is trying to be nice, his cloak of cruelty shows up. There's nothing good about the devil. He is a bad devil. The deceit of the enemy is trying to convince you that what he is doing in your life is coming from God. Once you begin to mistake the doings of the enemy for God, your faith dwindles. You begin to be afraid of God and you begin to think that God doesn't love you. Then you begin to condemn yourself, thinking perhaps you are suffering the repercussions of something way back in your past. But if it is truly in your past, it is in the sea of forgetfulness. It is past. God is simply a good God. Protected by divine life. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. This is in John chapter 10, verses 10 to 11. All the destructions and mayhems are the works of the devil, not God. Jesus came to give abundant life, life to the overflow. This is not just an existence, but an overcoming productive life. This is Zoe, the God kind and quality of life. This is the life that triumphs over evil, the life that is victorious despite the odds against it, the life that prevails even over the advances of the adversary. This is the life Jesus came to give in abundance. So let us not mistake the doings of the enemy for God. God is not responsible for miscarriages. God is not responsible for poverty and lack. God is not responsible for an untimely death. God is not responsible for sickness and disease. He is not responsible for the hunger and starvation we find across the globe. He is not. There is a wicked devil on the rampage and the one way to gain mastery and victory over the devil is to come under the government of God where you are no longer in the world system. In Exodus, we see something remarkable. The Egyptians suffered several plagues in darkness and destruction, but God created a sphere called Goshen, where his people were kept safe. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end, thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. This is in Exodus chapter 8 verses 22 to 23. Can you imagine the disaster reaching the houses before and after yours? But somehow, your house was preserved? The Bible says in Psalm 91 verse 7, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. You are marked out by the blood of the Lamb, such that when destruction comes upon the land, it has no choice but to pass over. You are marked by the blood. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. We see that the devil is the oppressor, but Jesus is the healer. If there is anything good, it's God, and if there is anything bad, it's the devil. A woman had been bound by the spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Jesus saw her and said, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bound on the Sabbath day? This is in Luke chapter 13 verse 16. He called her daughter of Abraham, a recipient of the covenant. Yet the religious bigots of that day were complaining about Jesus working a miracle on Sabbath day. Isn't it interesting how religion would want to stop you from being blessed? It tells you, you don't qualify. You haven't done enough praying. You haven't performed the whole routine. You haven't bowed down the number of times required for this kind of miracle. You haven't fasted that kind of fasting you ought to, to qualify for this kind of breakthrough. How would you dare think to be blessed without paying the price? Mercy. 
your right to deliverance. I am talking about laws and religion, but Jesus loves you so much that when it is time for your freedom, he is willing to set aside traditions and religions that say you are not qualified to be delivered and elevated. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loosed? In other words, it's her right, based on the covenant and not what she had done right. She is qualified based on her relationship with Abraham, the man of covenant. For those of us in the New Testament, our qualification is Jesus who died, was buried and rose from the dead. He is our qualification for breakthrough. We have to recognize that Jesus has paid the price for our lives and the price was a full price. The word redeem means to buy back. He didn't partially buy you. He paid in full. We were sold out to iniquity by our first parents in the Garden of Eden. We were sold to disease, poverty and all sorts of problems. But Jesus came to do one thing, to buy us back. That means he exchanged something valuable for you. He exchanged his blood, his life for you. He doesn't owe the devil anything. So if the enemy tries to mess around with your body, mind, emotions or finances, it is illegal according to the law of the kingdom. It is trespassing. And what you do when you catch a trespasser is to shout, Get out of my property. You have no right to be here. You were fully bought. The price was fully paid for your liberty. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking and nothing wanting. This is what peace is all about. It's shalom, the peace of God. James chapter 2 verse 13 says, For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. The Amplified Version reads, Mercy, full of glad confidence, exalts victoriously over judgment. Mercy gives you confidence. When you have a revelation of the mercy of God, it assures you, there is no longer a sense of guilt or condemnation before your father because you come to him, not in your name or by your right, but in the name of Jesus, in his stead. When you learn to get a hold of the mercy of God, it will cause you to prevail over judgment. The handwriting on the wall against you will be blotted out. Mercy speaks victory and petitions for you in the court of justice. Whenever you find yourself in a situation you can't get out of, don't plead guilty or not guilty, plead mercy. Because mercy takes you out of it without respect to your being right and wrong. People think that you go to heaven when God weighs your deeds and the good outweighs the bad. Not so. You can never do good enough to make heaven, no matter how morally upright you may be. Whatever you think makes you good does not qualify you. The only way to qualify is by accepting the finished work of redemption by faith. Believe with your heart that Jesus paid the price and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Then you are saved, acquitted and discharged. It is not by works or by strength. Mercy to recover your losses. The book of Mark chapter 10 verses 46 to 52 reads, And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out loud and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. A blind man called Bartimaeus heard Jesus was passing by one day. He had heard of the Master, how he was compassionate and powerful. He had heard about the great things Jesus was doing and saw that this was an opportune time in destiny. Now and then, God brings you into a Kairos moment. A moment where the water is being stirred and you need to jump into the water. At that moment, don't be too intelligent. Don't rationalize and don't bring in reasoning. It is a moment when one destiny step can change your whole life. You never lose it all. Blind Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus and how Jesus was passing his way. Guess what he did? He threw off all dignity and all limitations. He was blind, but he said, well, I can still talk. I still have my mouth. 
This is something so special about God. No matter how many things you lose in life, God will never allow you to lose everything. There must be something that remains. So scripture speaks of strengthening not the things that are lost, but those that remain. This is in Revelation chapter 3 verse 2. Stop complaining about what you lost. There are still some things left. There is life within you. Some things are remaining. Most of us have two legs, two hands, a pair of eyes, a mouth that talks, a nose that breathes in and out, and other functional body parts we barely notice. There is still something remaining. If you can clap, clap. If you can't jump, wiggle your feet. You must do something. But your mouth cried out for mercy and got his miracle. Use what remains to gain what is lacking. Don't take no for an answer. The Bible says the disciples and others standing around tried to silence him, but he refused to be silenced. Refuse to let men silence you. As Bartimaeus called more and cried louder, Jesus stood still. Your cry for help will get the attention of Jesus. Jesus gave him a blank check. Now you have my attention. What do you want? Praise gets the attention of the master, and then you will hear thy faith hath made thee whole according to mark chapter 10 verse 52 i'm thankful that daddy is not only the coach but also the referee he knows when to blow the whistle he won't blow the whistle when i am down the whistle will not blow until you are on your feet in victory in second corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 it reads now thanks be to god which always causeth us to triumph in christ and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place relax God is at work. God is working out your triumph in Christ. It is not yet a finished product, but he is working it out. He is behind the scenes working it out for you. He is the puppet master pulling the strings of life and destiny, working it all out for you. He says he will cause everything to work together for your good. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He is shaking them all up together at the end of the day. It is going to be a solution, an answer to your prayers. It's your joy to know he is the potter and I am the clay. He's helping me out. Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 4 says, "And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Even when the clay was marred in the hand of the potter, he knew how to make it into another vessel. The potter says he will keep on working on me until I become a fitting vessel. He's working on me. He is at work." In Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 it says for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure the spirit of God is at work within you causing you to act according to his good pleasure God is still at work mercy is still at work and grace is still at work when you have the revelation of mercy it causes your faith to rise when you know that God is compassionate and not cruel it shoots up your faith in him In 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 it says perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment the thing that can replace fear in your life is to embrace the love of the father for you he loves you and he will never be wicked or evil to you can you trust your father god my children have never had to believe god for food they naturally expect me to meet that need so they don't beg for it they trust that daddy is able but they also trust that daddy is willing You need to believe that God is not only able but also willing. We mostly believe he's able. He is willing to heal you. He is willing to prosper you. He is willing to break the chains holding your feet down. He is willing to promote you and to give you the job of your dream. God is willing to give you a turnaround and to give you that car and that house. He is willing to fulfill the dreams he gave you. He is neither stingy nor wicked. He is willing. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 to 6 says Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths Also in Psalm 37 verse 4 it says commit thy ways unto the Lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass Believers trust goes beyond faith There is a point where faith graduates to trust I'm no longer psyching myself up to believe I'm no longer trying to confess in order to bring things to pass. No. This is the place of trust. Trust is a place of covenant relationship. We ought to grow from just believing God for things to trusting him for who he is. A revelation of his love will cast out fear. Fear is like a demon. But if you see how much God loves you and gave his son for you while you were a sinner, 
Then imagine what he will do now that you are his. The revelation of mercy will cause faith to rise in your heart. It brings hope and hope is the track on which faith moves. If there is no hope, there is nothing faith can bring into actualization. As we teach about faith, we have to also teach the church about hope because where there is no hope, faith has nothing to substantiate or to hold as a target. Dreams are powerful. My dreams are part of the reasons why I wake up every day. You may be on the cross, but you know that God gave you more dreams than your situation. It is only a pathway to glory. Keep your dreams alive and keep your hopes alive. Keep things around you that excite your dream. Keep company with people who feed your dream. From time to time, drive around places that give you a picture of your future. Relate with people who are already where you are going to. If you are the best man in the team, you are in the wrong team. You ought to be in a team where you are challenged and provoked to work better. Don't be a local champion. If nothing seems to be working now, let your dream make you rejoice because he will make you walk upon your high places. As recorded in Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 18 to 19, you may be in the valley right now, but you are going to a higher ground, the ground of integrity, holiness, purity, the grace, mercy and loving kindness of the Lord. You are going to higher ground. I have a dream and I will not die without seeing my dream come into manifestation. The church will be revived from her lethargy and the youngest Christian will be a repository of the power of God. The little ones will become significant. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 5 says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Chapter 7 Think Your Way Out For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. This is in Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7. Also in Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 2 it reads, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors, until the time appointed of the Father. Nobody can live above his or her thoughts. The quality of a person's life is directly proportional to the content of his or her thoughts. If ever you're going to improve the quality of your life, the first thing you have to do is to improve the quality of your thoughts. You may believe God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, as recorded in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, but this indicates that you must be praying and thinking in the first place. Even then, God can only bless you so much beyond your thinking, but your lack of capacity will make the blessing cave in on you. Just like it will be erroneous for a man to bless his seven-year-old son with a brand new car, God will not give us blessings as much as the man can afford it. He knows it's unwise to bless his son with it because the son wouldn't have the capacity to handle the blessing. If God were to give you a blessing you don't have the inner strength to handle, that blessing could turn around to be a curse. There are dimensions of wealth that God won't make available for some of his children until they mature in their thoughts. Good thinking, good products. Until you grow in your thoughts, certain things will not be made available to you. So the first place that real change begins in a man's life is his thought realm. Your thoughts are supposed to be the stream of creativity in your life. Somebody once said, When you sow a thought, you will reap an action. When you sow an action, you will reap habit. When you sow a habit, you will reap a character. And when you sow a character, you will reap a destiny. That means the root and foundation of every man's destiny is his thoughts. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10 says, And now also the axe is laid onto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. If you are going to destroy anything, you have to destroy it from the root. If you destroy a tree by cutting off just the branch, the branch will grow again. So if you are going to destroy a wrong trend in your life, you have to go for the thoughts about them and destroy them. Don't let your sordid past make you pessimistic about the future. Reform your life by thinking upon God's word that promises you a glorious future. And let nobody judge your future by your present or past. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you hope and a future. Now, if this assertion is correct, it means a man can truly change his entire life if he can change his thoughts. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you can think about it long enough, you will have it. The things I thought long enough before, I find myself stumbling into without even offering prayers. When I stumble into them, I realize that I have been here before. I have said this. I have done that. I saw myself in my thoughts before I got there physically. It was all done between my ears. You need to go into your future and taste it while you are yet in your present by engaging your thoughts. Like those 12 spies sent into Canaan, sometimes you need to go into your future and access what God has for you. Have a taste of the grapes of Canaan and come back into the present. Let the enemy know that you have already tasted the grapes of the future, though he may try to shut you out of your future or cause delay. I tasted what it meant to be married before I got married. I knew what it was to be a father before I had children. I tasted what it meant to drive a car before a car came. The devil can't keep you from a future you have tasted. Architects carry out a process in their design, similar to what God did at creation. For instance, before an architect designs a building with paper and pen, he has to conceive it first. He has the structure clear on the canvas of his heart. What he shows you is a blueprint. But before that design comes into limelight, it was in his heart. The Lord put a thought or a seed in the heart of that architect. The building exists first in his mind and then it gets on paper before it becomes a touchable reality. What you become in life has always been a thought in your mind. This thought or concept should be strong enough for you to be meditating upon regularly, even unconsciously. Truly, you need to think about what you're thinking about. What you're thinking about at any time is very important. You can think your way out of defeat. You can think your way out of poverty and you can think your way out of slavery. Also, you can convert the creative abilities God has put in your inside and pervert them to think your way into poverty, defeat and weakness. God gave you that creative capacity but it is up to you to use it for good or for evil. In Luke chapter 15 verse 17, it says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? In Luke 15, the Bible talks about the prodigal son. He'd left his father and gone to spend all his inheritance, and just as his cash was gone, a famine came, and he suffered starvation till he lost his dignity. At that point, the Bible says, He came to himself. That means he considered in his mind. That boy got back to his father's house mentally before he went there physically. Even though he was still among pigs, hungry and disgusting, when he came to himself, he was back home. Creative thinking The moment you come to yourself, you come to terms with who you are and have no need to prove or endorse yourself before any man. You just know you are a prince or a princess of the living God. The economy can lie to you, but like the prodigal son, you need to come back to yourself. A relationship or business can lie to you, but you are coming back to yourself. One creative idea from God can give your whole life and finances a forceful turnaround. I'm yet to see the one genuinely successful man who succeeded without thinking creatively. Sometimes we find ourselves having so many bills to pay, thinking we have a money problem. But people don't have so much a money problem as they do have an idea problem. Too few people think creatively, so everyone swoons around creative people. Have you noticed that most people are copycats? They wait for somebody to start something nobody has done before. If you fail, they boo you, and if you succeed, they clap for you and then copy. Very few people are willing to dare to enter their uncharted territory or take the less beaten path. Like magnets attract metals, resources naturally flow towards ideas. The inventions you see around us were not by people who desired to make money. They simply wanted to help humanity by proffering solution to some problems. If you are going to last in a business, don't start a business desiring to make money. It is not a wise reason to start a business. You should start a business essentially to add value to lives. If you are going to grow and last in business, if you are going to make a name in business, your reason must be to add value. In other words, your first question should be, what do people need? It shouldn't be, how can I rip people off? If you stay in a city littered with dirt, you'd be on your way to a lot of money if you can think of and implement a creative way to keep the streets clean. Find where you fit. Some of the things we do as jobs, professions and careers are simply things our parents encouraged us to do. Many parents want their children to be lawyers, doctors, accountants, engineers or some other profession perceived to be lucrative. 
You see, the areas where you can make the most money are the areas you call your hobby, the things you do for pleasure. For example, it is leisure for some people to listen to music, while it is leisure for some others to play the piano and show others how to do it. Those fingers can bring you some gold daily. Do you just love sewing and knitting or cooking new recipes? You call it mere hobby, but God said, This is the place I have stored up your blessing. Work must perform two functions for us, creation and recreation. Work can bring cool cash to you, yes, but you've got to find relaxation while working or you will die before your time. I love preaching. I love to stand, pick up a microphone and just talk about Jesus. It is my joy, it excites me and I go back feeling refreshed. But it is work that gives me pleasure. It takes a lot of hard work to sit and think, to pray and study. But that is the job I'm called to do and I completely enjoy every aspect of it. How passionate are you about your career? Perhaps you're doing a dumb job just to get by, but you know it's not what you're called to do, not what thrills you. Elisha was following after some dumb oxen, but when Elijah threw the mantle on him, he left the oxen and followed his new master because he knew it was time to change course. There's a time to be in the background, but you must not die in the shadows. You can't keep going about begging for contracts or projects. There must come a time when you step into your destiny path and make a mark. When you have what people need and show it to them, they will come and pay you for it. There is something in you that is in raw form and needs to be pulled out and refined to become marketable. I used to see myself as a pastor of just one local church in the capital city of Nigeria. But one day I changed my mind. Today, I preach to an international audience as a pastor of pastors and a coach of coaches. And you know what? My style of preaching has changed as my mindset changed. Whatever gifts you have, grow them such that they become conspicuous any way you show up. That is the way you give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear unto all, as reflected in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Upgrade yourself upstairs. You need to change how you see yourself. One of the problems with folks is this. They want a promotion, but they don't want to improve or develop themselves. Your job description, for instance, is A to D. But go beyond that and do E to Z. If you're willing to pay the price to think creatively, you will be a pay setter. Education is not the same as creative thinking. Formal education should aid creative thinking, but doesn't necessarily generate thinking creatively. I've seen people who are educated but don't think creatively. I've also seen people not particularly educated, but they have trained themselves to think creatively. Education is good, but you need to add the necessary practice to your education to think creatively. Let this soak in. He that knows what to do has a job, but he that knows how to do the job is the boss. That's creative thinking. Have you noticed that people at the top of an organization, that's the executives, are the highest paid? Do you know why? It's because executives think executive. They get paid for executive thinking. They don't have two heads or four feet and they don't walk around the clock. They are not executives because they wear a suit or tie or drive Porsche cars. They are executives because they think executively. Executive thinking is creative thinking. Creative thinking is problem solving. In life, people get paid for the problems they help others solve. And executives tend to solve the most problems because they think executively. They think beyond the moment and project into the future. Whatever job you are doing now, be it as a janitor, plumber, tailor or whatever it is, distinguish yourself in it by thinking executively. There is nothing wrong with any job. What is wrong is how people think while on the job. Engineers, for example, because of exposure and training, think differently from mechanics. A mechanic may be able to do more practical work than an engineer, but the engineer thinks executively. The engineer thinks in terms of problem solving, how he can go beyond repairing a speaker to manufacturing speakers, but the mechanic will die repairing speakers. If you're a mechanic, there's nothing wrong with being a mechanic but it's wrong for you to think at the level of mechanics. When you begin to think above and beyond the level of people in your career, you automatically come out on top. If you are a church worker, don't think like the average church worker. The typical church worker thinks, I'm only a volunteer so I can show up when it is convenient for me. Now, if you're going to excel in ministry, you have got to see your church work as a test. Can I deliver voluntarily as though I was being paid? Indeed, God will pay you. But first, he's testing you. That's creative thinking. Refuse to be refused. 
Think about your life and all the things you gave up on interviews, examinations, relationships, marriages, even contracts. Persistence pays. I refuse to be refused in this life. I refuse to be told there's a place in life I can't go. With God on my side, I will go there. Never take no for an answer. Refuse to be refused. Did they say no in that office where you went for a job contract? Try again. Did she say no to you? Try again. Your marriage broke down? Try again. Jesus healed a man at Bethsaida. The first time he laid hands, the man said, I see men as trees walking. Jesus laid hands on the man's eyes a second time before he saw clearly. This is recorded in Mark chapter 8 verses 22 to 25. When Elijah prayed for rain, he sent his servant seven times to go and check before he saw a sign. Yet he was praying all the time. Again, this is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 41 to 45. It means that even when God is involved, sometimes you will need to persist to get your desire. So try again. Never take no for an answer. When there seems to be no way, Jesus is the way. This is in John chapter 14 verse 6. The difference between a failure and a success is perspective. It's an outlook. A success-driven person possesses the spirit of success and his emotions flow with it. He may not be successful yet, but his speech communicates success. He has a spring in his steps, some unusual confidence that makes people wonder at him. He has no car, but he walks as if he owns a fleet of them. He is single, but he conducts himself as though he is sired by kids. I like people like that who chin up and clean off sweat before they get into an office. They exude success and speak with confidence. They turn obstacles into miracles. At a time when Israel's elite soldiers fled from Goliath with the thought that he was too big to hit, David saw the same giant as too big for the stone to miss. Every big vehicle has a small keyhole and a steering wheel. I'm talking about perspective, thinking patterns, a shift from the failure mentality to the success mentality. A successful person sees stumbling blocks as stepping stones. He sees a closed door and appreciates freedom from the stress as he seeks an open door. God loves your creativity. Somebody once said that success dress in work clothes so that lazy people won't find them. Nothing just happens in life. Everything is made to happen. God put in man a creative seed because God himself is creative and he made man just like himself. God has finished the work of creation, but he left creativity as man's unfinished work. Man draws upon his divine creative instincts to master nature. He made ores and we refine them. He made trees and we make furniture and paper out of them. He made fruits and herbs and we make them into medicines and juices. When we go to God in prayer, he gives us seed and we plant and water it to get a harvest. For instance, man has to invent the microphone and the telephone to meet the need of communicating over long distances. He gave us a voice, but we have to find ways to amplify it. If God gave us the harvest, man would have no use for creativity. So God gives man the seed, the inspiration, but man brings the idea into manifestation. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. This is in Genesis chapter 1 verses 2 to 3. God saw a world that was formless and empty, and in that mess, God saw a possibility of a beautiful earth with trees, mountains, valleys, seas and animals with a man as the pinnacle of his creation. That was his dream, his idea, and he brought it into reality. When you pray expecting God to give you an answer, he does. But what he gives you is the seed you use to create what you need. For as the rain cometh down and snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This is in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 10. The scripture shows that the God that gives seed to the sower is the same God that gives bread to the eater. We think about food, but God thinks about seed. You ask God for a million dollar business breakthrough. He says, here, take it, and you're waiting for the money while he's given you a million dollar idea so that you can tap into your creative resources. Jesus shared a parable we call it the parable of the sower, possibly one of the most important in the Bible. Jesus implied in Mark chapter 4 verse 13 that the understanding of that parable helps us to understand other parables. I believe it helps us understand the entire scripture. Life is all about three things. One, seed. Two, time. 
And three, harvest. What you sow is what you reap. You can't get a harvest different from what you sow. The seed is your thought. When you allow God to plant the right thoughts in your mind, you reap a harvest. Did you know that when you have a good seed planted in good ground, you can be sure that there is good harvest coming? Many times we want to sow from our harvest, but God designed sowing for our harvest. When you get your harvest, you are not sowing for that harvest again. You are sowing for the next harvest. It is common saying that talk is cheap and thought is cheap, but I'll tell you, good thinking is not cheap. It takes a lot of work to think creatively. So think. Chapter 8 Talk Your Way Through And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance on righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he will fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. This was recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 22. Don't be critical. It is not a strange thing for us as Christians to get in a mess intermittently, if you've been around a while, you would have quickly discovered that life is not as smooth as a journey as we all would desire it to be. It is rather unfortunate, but that is the fact of life. Life's dotted with bumps, rough patches, riddles, obstacles, situations and circumstances that almost seem to prevail upon us. Bumps vary from person to person, just as our faces vary. In fact, we complement each other because your weakness may be my strength and my weakness may be your strength. This is why as Christians, while helping others who are in a falling or broken state, we must do so rather cautiously and with a lot of humility, understanding that justice is the exclusive preserve of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Whenever it is your turn to correct somebody who is in a state of weakness, fallen, or somebody who has a fault, do so with all caution. Because as it is commonly said, those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 2, it says, Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you again. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Thus, in correcting and instructing people over whom we have been called to stand as leaders or mentors, we must maintain a posture of humility and not one of pride. We are only in a situation of temporary advantage, not necessarily because we are better than those answerable to us. The story of the prodigal son epitomizes someone who is on a downward trend of destruction because of bad choices. 
If you were sincere enough with yourself, you would admit that at some point in your life, you have suffered from your indiscretion, not because the devil is on your case. As a preacher, I can identify with people who took a premeditated decision to leave school before completion out of newfound zeal, having gotten born again and feeling that it was necessary to preach the gospel because the end of the world is near. That could be zeal without a balanced knowledge of God's word. If you left or got fired from your job, one that God opened to provide for you, because of disagreement that came out of your ineptitude or malfeasance in the office, there isn't any devil chasing you. Perhaps you are single and feel lonely in your 30s or 40s with no serious relationship and looking back and seeing that there were several opportunities to find a life partner. Maybe you lost your marriage due to a lack of emotional intelligence or lack of moral excellence. There is no devil in your case. It's an inner battle you have to fight with yourself. God loves prodigal sons. In one way or the other, at some point in our lives, we can identify with the prodigal son because we've made decisions that have affected our lives adversely. But before you condemn yourself, I have a word for you. Jesus loves prodigal sons. You can see in our text that the father, a type of our heavenly father, had long forgiven the prodigal son and celebrated him as soon as he returned home. The father slew the fattest cow for him and put upon him the royal robe and ring and sandals. God loves the prodigal son. I can identify with this lad. After all, many years ago, before the age of 17, when I came to know Jesus, I was full of excitement because I said yes to the Lord with great zeal and passion for the things of God. I went to my hometown all by myself, got a bunch of people together and held a crusade at about 18 years of age. My parents began to think that their son had gone bonkers. What has happened to our little boy, Obi? He went to school and came back a religious bigot. And I didn't help matters either because I had great zeal with little knowledge. I wrote my dad way back from Amadubello University, Zaria, Nigeria, in my first year, telling him I had become born again. A few months later, I upgraded the first letter, telling him that I was not only born again, but also called to the ministry. That, my parents couldn't understand. After a few years, I discovered that I was just like a prodigal son, and several more years after that, I had to make my way back home to make peace. Now, making peace didn't change my calling, ministry, or anointing, but I repented and returned home. The truth about the parable. Quite unfortunately, many preachers justify the elder brother in our text while crucifying the younger brother, the so-called prodigal son. They have misinterpreted the text, distorted the truth contained therein, and in so doing have raised many false allegations against the prodigal son. I dare stand in his defense because he's certainly not what some preachers have made him out to be. There is a lot of good to be gleaned from the life of the prodigal son. We have generally given the impression that a story of the younger son is one of a zealous boy whose greed and overambitious crave for wealth and riches destroyed. We've believed, albeit incorrectly, that the reason the young man asked for his inheritance was lost for wealth. But this is very far from the truth. I put it to you as an advocate and legal counsel of the prodigal son that he grew up in a privileged household born with a silver spoon in his mouth, maybe even a golden spoon. His dad was wealthy and both brothers had equal access to all that belonged to the rich father. Look at these boys. They had the best of food, shelter and clothing, plus numerous servants at their beck and call. Now whether or not they utilized what rightly belonged to them is a different issue. These boys had more than enough of everything and a closer look will reveal that the real problem of the prodigal son was that he wanted to exercise control. He wanted to feel in charge of his life and destiny. He didn't only desire the riches, wealth and splendor of his father, but he also wanted independence. Thus, the prodigal son began to feel he needed to break away from instituted authority and enjoy control over his life. The Restless Spirit This reminds me of many people today. They enjoy the fat salary from the company they work for, but hate to be controlled by their boss. They hate being under rules and regulations, having to work on another's orders. The prodigal son likes to come and go when he likes. He wants the blessings, favor and protection that comes by being under a good local assembly, but doesn't want to be controlled by the pastor or other designated leaders of that group or ministry. Control is the issue here. A glaring home truth 
is that every man who desires to be under no control has lost control of his life. The Master rightly tells us that for you to have and wield authority, you must be a man under authority. It pays to have someone who can look into your eyes, tell you where you have missed it and shake you up to change directions. A leader without another leader is a vagabond. He is a tool in the hands of the adversary because of his power that lacks guidance and control. You will quickly discover that a restless spirit is no other than the spirit of Lucifer, who has now become Satan the devil. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. According to Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 14, Lucifer was close to God. He was the covering of the glory of Yahweh. But after a while, the spirit of restlessness began to move him to desire more, seeking to break away from under God's control and to wield all that power by himself. This is the spirit of restlessness. Restlessness causes disorder, chaos and mayhem. The enemy doesn't like order. To see people in their right rank and file, he wants you to break ranks and when you do that, the anointing of God leaves. Shun Selfishness Psalm 133 verse 1 reads, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Dwelling together in unity connotes order. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 40, Let all things be done decently and in order. People who have a restless spirit never want to be controlled. They want to be in charge wherever they go. If you are not being controlled by God, whether directly or indirectly, your life is out of control. You think you are in charge, but you are out of control. Paul said further that we who are free from sin became slaves to God and His righteousness. This is in Romans chapter 6 verses 16 to 22. True liberty only comes as we acknowledge that we are born servants and say to God, Let your will be done. Let us return to our story as I continue in my role as legal counsel to the prodigal son. One thing I like about this gentleman is that he was not selfish. He was outside his father's house but loaded to the brim. Yet, he gave generously. Many today refuse to identify with the prodigal son, yet very stingy, timid and judgmental, just like the legalistic elder brother who stayed at home but was self-centered. You must fight the evil spirit of stinginess, the antichrist spirit that sponsors the love of money and possessions to the detriment of others' well-being. We are blessed to be a blessing. The prodigal son didn't hoard his blessings. Don't be stingy. Some are even stingy in their offerings to God, giving him tips. You know God has blessed you, but all you give God is tips, like a waiter that served you. It's a big shame. God is the reason you have breath in your nostrils. He is the reason you are healthy and have a job that pays, and a skill that sells. Whatever good thing you have in your life is there on account of God. You got it not by might nor power, but only by the grace of God as reflected in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. See, when God has your name on a blessing, no man can get to it. Some people may appear faster than you, but they can't get to your blessing because it has your name. And that is why when Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus and called Lazarus forth, there were several dead men called Lazarus. But Jesus spoke to a particular Lazarus. Lazarus came forth because the blessing was on him. God has a definite blessing with your name and no man can get to it. Once I wanted to prove God is indeed limitless, so I applied for a visa to a particular country and picked the option of multiple entries. Long story cut short, with no prior visit to the country, I got a visa valid for six months, yet was billed the amount for a single visa. It tells you that even when you do not deserve it, God will reserve it for you because grace is so amazing. God made Pharaoh pay the bills to raise Moses in his own house. And Moses was going to plunder Egypt's riches and utterly annihilate her armies. God will make your enemies pay your bills. They may not like you, but they will do it because God said so. Furthermore, the prodigal son was someone who had no issues speaking his mind on issues that bothered him. The lad walked up boldly to his dad to make a bold request, most certainly taboo then and even now in many cultures. But you see, one kind of personality I find it very difficult to work with is the kind of people that would be close to you for a long time and never bear their minds. None of my close staff will ever fall into this category. I choose my team very carefully. People like the elder son who stayed with his father for so long, seething with resentment but putting up the veneer of loyalty, are two-faced. Such a person hides his true feelings from you and expresses his hypocritical feelings to you. 
He doesn't like you. But while he's standing in front of you, he pays lip service and praises you, then goes behind you and gossip. I can't stand such people. They are hypocrites and psychophants and could kill. The elder son was living in silent frustration, but the younger son spoke up and got what he wanted. He was not a hypocrite. Talk your way out of trouble. Here's something I like about the young man. He knew how to negotiate and navigate his way out of trouble. In Luke chapter 15 verse 17 it says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? A pressure cooker has a valve for escape of pressure. So our mouths have been given unto us as gates to express the internal boilings of our hearts and minds. You need to be careful what you say in time of excitement or trouble, for it can make the difference between success and failure, victory and defeat, and life and death. Words are the most powerful tools of war. They are, in fact, at the root of most wars. When a peace accord comes into force, it is also traceable to words. Words are not mere speech. They are spirit forces. John chapter 6 verse 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Words can either make or mar a man. Words are so powerful that the second person of the Godhead is called the Word of God, as reflected in John chapter 1 verse 1 and also in Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 13. Every word spoken is a container. Please understand that there are no such things as inactive, dormant or unimportant words. Words are either creative or destructive. You determine with your words what your life becomes. Matthew chapter 12 verse 36 to 37 reads, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The day of judgment isn't only the day the master will sit upon the throne and judge us all. It essentially refers to the day you reap the fruit of what you said. Victory in every battle you encounter in life as a Christian is consequent on your ability to talk your way out. Your own words will either liberate you or destroy you. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. This is in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21. Also in Proverbs chapter 6 verse 2 it reads, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Also in Job chapter 6 verse 25 it says, How forcible are right words, but what doth your arguing reprove? Residing in the tongue of every man is the dual power of life and death. Salvation at the new birth is tied to the use of your mouth. In Romans chapter 10 verse 10 it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The heart is the loading of the bullet, and the mouth is the trigger or release of the loaded bullet. Many times we keep confessing and nothing is happening because we are firing blanks. We are not yet loaded. Your heart needs to be loaded with the word of God, the most lethal weapon. If your heart is loaded with what God has said about you and you release what God says through your mouth, speaking in consent with Him, it works awesome stuff for you. Put your mouth to work. I like what a great man of God said. Soundless Christians are signless Christians. You don't receive signs and wonders in your walk with God until you make sounds and only confident, loud-mouthed Christians command the miraculous in the kingdom. But it is sad to know that many people don't say anything. Their mouths are shut because they are afraid of, what if I say it and it doesn't come to pass? It means you don't believe it. If you see any minister that makes some kind of declaration that doesn't seem to make sense from where he is, it is because he has seen ahead and is calling the things that be not as though they were, as it says in Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. What you see is what you win. We are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 But the only release valve to manifest what you see is your mouth. The Bible in Psalm 119 verse 130 says, The entrance of the word of God gives light and understanding to the simple. It is not enough for you to confess that by his stripes you are healed. It won't do the magic until your heart is in agreement with your mouth. Confession works when the heart and the mouth are in concert. Believe 
and speak. Psalm 81 verse 10 says, Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. In the creation account in the first chapter of Genesis, you will see the phrase, And God said, repeated time and again, God was showing us the creative power resident in words. As the image of God made after his likeness, we create things with our words. You need to keep saying what you desire until it comes alive. Your mouth isn't only for eating, it is also a weapon. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 26 records that God confirms the word of his servant. Unless the servant says something, God's got nothing to work with. What you say is what you get. No matter how hopeless or prodigal your situation is, if you begin to say the right thing, sooner or later, deliverance will come. Undoubtedly, the battle between David and Goliath was a battle of words. Goliath had so threatened the children of Israel with his thundering voice and imposing size that Israel's soldiers became intimidated and men of war turned into cowards. But David came on the scene and began to give Goliath a good run for his loud-mouthed boasting. He testified of God's past interventions in his life to the armies of Israel and then went on to rubbish Goliath with his words. He first told the soldiers around him, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. Then he got introduced to Saul who then rated him inadequate for the task. But David spoke up again and began to testify of how he had killed a lion and a bear when they attacked his father's sheep. He then finished off with these words, Thy servants slew the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. The Lord had delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. As recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 36 to 37. Next, David went out to face the giant and the war of words continued. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. This is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 43 to 47. Stunned by the audacity of this little boy before him, Goliath stood rooted in the spot till the stone sank into his forehead and he dropped to the ground. Even before Goliath was brought down and beheaded, he was already dead by the words of a shepherd boy David who did to the giant and the armies of the Philistines exactly what he had said. He took Goliath's head and fed the birds and the beasts the corpses of the Philistine soldiers. You've got to talk your way out of what seems to be an enclosure. Chapter 9 Keys to Finishing Well The book of Matthew chapter 21 verses 28 to 32 reads, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go walk today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went, and he came to the second son and said likewise. And he answered and said, I will go, sir. And he went not whether of them twain did the will of the Father. They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. The story in the text is about a father 
who had two sons and asked each separately to go out in the vineyard. The first son replied in rebuttal, but had second thoughts and went. The second replied in acceptance and proved his words empty. He did not go. One moral of this story, amongst others, is that it's not always how one begins that he ends up in life. It's possible to start well, but not end up well. The most important thing in life is not how you begin life, but how you end. The person who starts a race fastest may not win the race. The winner will not be picked and announced based on who went ahead first, but who hits the finishing line first. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. This is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. How you finish anything in this life is all important because what people tend to remember about you is not how you began or what you went through, but how you ended up. When you see any successful man in society today, nobody will ask the man how he began. Nobody asks the man what kind of challenges he went through to become what he is. All they see is that the man is successful. They may ask out of curiosity, but they only become interested because he ended well in the first place. Above all, end well. Never forget this. How you finish in life is more important than how you begin. That's why you have to make up your mind and purpose in your heart that you will finish well no matter what happens to you. Determine that even if you have to cross a few mountains and seas and go through detours, you will finish well. You may have to go through a few valleys, but make up your mind, you will finish well. You may have to deal with a few obstacles, but make up your mind, you will finish well. Because though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end shall greatly increase. This is in Job chapter 8 verse 7. God designed your life to glow and grow in glory. In divine agenda, today should be more glorious than yesterday. Destiny dictates that your tomorrow be brighter than today because your path has got to shine from glory to glory. In Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18 it reads, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You don't have to end up where you began in life. God has a glorious future ahead of you. And if you take the right steps, you'll walk into it. Your future in Christ is undeniably nothing compared to your experience. Your future is bright, glorious, exciting, wonderful, adventurous and beautiful. God is bringing you into your brighter and rewarding future. You will finish well. Abraham began life childless but ended up as a father of many nations. Moses was born as a slave and started stuttering, but ended up being God's deliverer to the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Saul of Tarsus started as a persecutor of the church, but ended up life as Paul, the apostle of Christ who wrote two-thirds of the epistles. Joseph found himself in the pit and then as a slave boy, but he ended up governor of Egypt. Jesus was born in a manger, but ended up at the right hand of the majesty on high. The father of glory. Folks, you may know your past, but only God knows your future. The Mystery of Life Life in itself is a great mystery. That's why life defies accurate definition. No human can accurately capture life. The source and origin of all life is God himself. In a sense, nobody has any life outside God. God is the source of all life. Have you ever wondered how your heart knows when to beat and how your body organs function by default under normal circumstances, that alone ought to make you thankful for life. That you live today is not by your power. Nobody sustains his life here on earth because he is powerful. You did not sleep and wake up because you are very powerful. No, you woke up because God gave you life. In Psalm 150 verses 1 to 6, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Anybody numbered with the living qualifies to give praise to God. What you need to praise God is not a new car, a new spouse, a child, a house or money. What you need to praise God is the breath of life trapped in your nostrils. So never you complain that God has not done anything in your life because you are still here by His grace, mercy and power. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. 
Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 to 23, it says, It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Life essentially is a gift from God. Have you ever noticed nobody ever asked God for life at birth? Did you ask your parents to conceive you? God gave you life because life is a gift. Life in itself is the greatest gift we receive from God and its purpose is so we can enjoy today. In essence then, the life you have is not yours. Your life belongs to God. But God gave you that life as a steward and at the end of life, you will go back to him and give an account of the life he gave you. The reason you are given an account of the life he gave you is that life is not your own. It was a gift. If you agree that the life you have today is, in a sense, not your life, it means that you can't afford to live life anyhow. Whenever anybody gives you a gift, they want you to receive the gift, acknowledge the gift, appreciate the gift, but also keep and use the gift well. Failure to do these ensures the person who gave you the gift has no pleasure in giving you any more gifts. And you must understand that every gift in life usually comes with an instruction manual or a label to guide you in its usage. The instruction helps you to enjoy the gift maximally and to take good care of it. Likewise, because God has given you and me the gift of life, He has also gone ahead to give us the manual of life, His Word, the Holy Bible. If you are going to enjoy life optimally and take care of this gift of life God has given us, we need to know what the giver said in the manual. Somebody said, when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. The gift of life is abused when we don't know the purpose of life. The word abuse is from two words, abnormal and use. Thus, abuse means abnormal use. Are you using or abusing life? Anything you do with life outside God's purpose for your life is an abnormal use of it. For example, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. This is part of your manufacturer's instructions for life. His instruction for you is that you be head and not tail, above only and not beneath. Now, when you live life beneath and not on top, you are abusing your God-giving life. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, God's purpose for you is to have dominion. So if you live being dominated, it's an abuse of the life God gave you. You need to know that God primarily created you on this earth for his pleasure. He gives us pleasure, as captured in Psalm 16 verse 11. But he also created us for his pleasure, as reflected in Revelations chapter 4 verse 11. We may not have thought of it in this manner, but God wants to enjoy as much as he wants you to enjoy life. He loves to hang out with you and enjoy times of refreshing with you. Prayer should be used for mutual pleasure with God and not just to bombard him with your wish list. In pleasing God, you enjoy him. 7 Keys to Finishing Well 1. Understand the race you are called to run. God created you in life as an original, not a cheap copy. There is a unique and peculiar call of God upon your life. There can be no better you in the world. You are and will ever be the best. Anybody taller than you is too tall. Anybody shorter than you is too short. The point is this. God designed you accurately and perfectly for the assignment he has for you. That means nobody can do better than what God designed you for. It also means God created you uniquely to fulfill a particular course here on earth. Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I like the word my. Paul understood he had a particular course to run. That means anybody who God creates in his image and his likeness has a particular course to run. You have a particular lane God wants you to run in life. There's a particular thing God wants you to do in life. When you try to be somebody else God didn't create you to be, you're going to be, at the very best, a photocopy of the original. If you're number six in a race and you cut to number one lane and come first, you will be disqualified because you ran in somebody else's lane. So the first key to finishing well 
is to find out your course, your race and your lane and keep to it. 2. Be disciplined. There can be no success in any aspect of life without discipline. Disciples are disciplined followers of a master. You can't succeed in any area of life without discipline. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 it says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul putting his body under subjection speaks of discipline. When you sow a thought, you reap an act. When you sow an act, you reap a habit. When you sow a habit, you reap character. And when you sow a character, you reap a destiny. Every good destiny starts with good thoughts. You have to learn how to discipline your thought life. Think thoughts that align with God's word and your God-given destiny. What you think consistently becomes a habit. You repeatedly do things out of your subconscious mind because they are habitual. After they become habits, they define your character and then your destiny. Discipline is important, but it has to begin with good thoughts. Nobody finishes fine in any area of life without being disciplined. It is very vital. Whatever you sow in life is what you will eventually reap in. Even though sometimes, as believers, we only wishfully think that something good will happen in our lives. But life is not about wishes. Life is all about what you make happen with the Word of God and by the power of His Spirit. 3. Learn to succeed daily. God leads us in steps, not in leaps. In Psalm 37 verse 23 it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. What you master daily, you will soon master in your life. God gives us life and breaks it into units called days. Several scriptures in the Bible talks about days. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 11 it says, Give us this day our daily bread. In Psalm 90 verse 12 it says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Again in Psalm 68 verse 19, it says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. And then in Psalm 118 verse 24, it says, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Accordingly, God talks and deals with us in days. In the Old Testament, God gave them manna sufficient for the day only to teach them how to live by the day, as reflected in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. If you can't succeed daily, then you can't succeed yearly. If you can't succeed yearly, then you won't succeed in a lifetime. Therefore, learn every day of your life and you will finish well. You can make measurable progress by the day. What you can do well today, you will do well in one month, one year and so forth. 4. Learn from experience. Failure is never final. You can turn around yesterday's failure into today's success. If you fall, get up and go at it again. In Proverbs chapter 24 verse 16, it says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Failure only becomes a failure when you agree. I wrote some professional exams many years ago to become a chartered accountant, some of which I wrote more than once, but I determined in my mind that I won't give up. I determined that the result they were showing me on the board is not my result. Mine is to be the head and not the tail. It is to be above only and not beneath. So, I went back to the examination hall to write the exam again until the examiner gave me the result I knew was mine, which is a success. They say experience is the best teacher. I agree, but a better teacher than your experience is that of somebody else because you don't have enough years to make enough mistakes to learn from. You need to learn from other people's experiences as well as yours. I even seek to learn from those who have failed. How not to fail? I am a good student of life. I make efforts to learn everywhere I go. If I see somebody doing well, I attempt to learn from how he or she is doing well. If I see you are not doing well in life, whether in academics, in ministry, in finances or career, I learn what not to do. If somebody has made a mistake, learn from their mistake. There are lots of experiences in the Word of God that will keep you from error. 5. Keep your eyes on the goal. There will be many occasions and reasons to be distracted along the way, but stay focused. Focus is your ability to lock your whole energy and resources in one direction. Refuse to stop in life until you get there. There means different things for different people. 
for we all have differing destinations. Refuse to stop. Do not be dismayed or discouraged till you get there. Stay focused. Stay focused on the vision God has given you. God can bring it to pass. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is recorded in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. If God shows you the dream, then he'll certainly bring it to pass. Stay focused. Don't stop until you get to your destination. What God told you about your marriage, ministry, finances and so on are true and attainable. Stay focused. Refuse to stop or be stopped until you get there. 6. Lay the weight aside. Because you are running a race and you want to finish well, you can't afford to carry weights, for they will weigh you down. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, it reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are compressed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. There are certain things in your life today that you need to stop, else they will stop you. There are things in your life that you need to destroy, or they will destroy you. You have to learn to lay aside the weights of your strife, envy, greed, bitterness, malice, lusts, covetousness, or whatever else affects your relationship with God and men. Lay aside the weights if you want to finish well. 7. Stand by faith. You need to recognize that the race is not run in our strength, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9, it says, He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Somebody once said that a day of favor is better than a thousand years in labor. In standing by faith, you have to learn how to appropriate the grace of God. Recognize that every step you take in life is by the grace of God and he'll give you a forceful turnaround. Jesus told Martha at the graveside of Lazarus, If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. This is in John chapter 11 verse 40. At the time Jesus spoke these words, Lazarus was four days dead, buried and stinking. Hold on to your faith. Don't let your faith go. Keep on believing the vision. I'd like to close this book with a verse of scripture that has encouraged many of God's children through the years. It's in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 and it reads, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now let's look at this verse from two other translations to give us rock solid assurance. The NIV says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. In the message translation, it reads, I know what I am doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. You have a great destiny. And as you let this understanding shape your thinking with great confidence in the integrity and awesome power of God, your manufacturer, you receive grace to run your race. Keep your eyes on him and on the vision he has given you. Lean hard on him. Follow him step by step and live day by day. Let your voice utter his words and let your actions be in alignment with his will. And you will grow and work stronger, doing exploits that will shake your generation and coming generations. Chapter 10 The Master Key to Success Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? 
For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. This is from Matthew chapter 6 verses 27 to 33. God has all it takes to do anything, but he will not do everything. He has the key to any door and has the power to move just any mountain, but he will neither open every door nor shift mountains around to prove how powerful he is. God is a God of order. God does not operate chaotically. He has bound himself by his word and will not do anything outside the ambits of the Holy Scriptures. The benevolence and omnipotence of God are regulated by the integrity of his word. We have examined principles and precepts in the last nine chapters of this book, but in this final subdivision, I want to drop a final word that I consider to be the nerve center and anchor that holds everything in this book in place. It's indeed the master key to the world of success. While many will be excited at the acts of God, there is much more in God that are only accessible to those that know his ways. Moses knew the ways of God, but unto the children of Israel, God showed only his acts. His acts, signs and wonders are contained in his ways. He that experiences the acts of God may not know the mechanics behind the miracle. So there is something about intimacy with God that gives you an edge over somebody who is pursuing just miracles, signs and breakthroughs. You are never designed to pursue miracles, but rather, miracles were designed to follow you. You are a miracle, a sign and a wonder. Your whole life is ordained to be a miracle. You didn't become a miracle when you were born. You became a miracle when you were conceived in the womb of your mother. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Look around your life. Things may be happening chaotically. No rhythm, no symphony and no harmony. But when you look around you, there is a God that has been pulling the strings and causing things around you to work together for your good, especially if you love Him. If it wasn't God who was on your side, there are many instances and incidences in your life where you would have been wiped out from the face of the earth. God has delivered you from far too many things that you don't know than the ones you do know. God has a grand purpose for keeping you till this time. You are indeed a miracle. In Job chapter 5 verse 22 it says, At destruction and famine, Thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. God designed a system for you to access the blessings that he has already made available to you to be revealed or to be made manifest. There is a covenant key that opens the door of success and everything desirable under the sun. Jesus handed it down. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It is a misnomer to be chasing after cars and houses. You are too big for that. Chasing breakthroughs and promotions. They ought to chase after you. You see, cars, houses and breakthroughs are good and are part of the bargain, but they are secondary benefits of redemption. The blessings follow behind you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for ever. This is in Psalm 23, verses 1 to 6. As you follow the Lord, goodness and mercy follows you. There is nothing you are looking for in life that is not found in the goodness and mercy of the Lord. Your heart has to be designed to be occupied and satisfied with Jesus and not things. How do you know that God is number one? You know so when you are occupied with thoughts of Him and His affairs. You know when He takes priority in your choices and decisions. It is very easy these days to commit the sin of idolatry without even knowing it. An idol is that thing you have placed in your heart where only God should be seated. An idol is a thing you can't lay at the feet of Jesus. Being in church doesn't guarantee you have made Jesus your number one and your all in all. Many are in church whose motives for being in church is not Jesus. 
Many come to church for what to get. Lovest thou me more than these? So when they had died, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. This is taken from John chapter 21 verses 15 to 17. What will distinguish you in these last days is not your ability to perform miracles, but simply your love for God. The Bible declares in Matthew chapter 24 verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Also in Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We need to return to our first love. Ask the Lord to set your heart on fire. The truth is that many won't admit that their love has waxed cold. The book of James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You need to initiate the movement because he has already opened the doors. He says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The issue is not about God making himself available to you. He is already available. Like the prodigal son, we are the ones that walked away and must find our way back home to the Lord and enter into his warm embrace. Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 13 to 14 says, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again unto the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. God will not settle for second place in your heart. The genuine thing about God is that He doesn't force Himself into your heart. He seeks for you to release yourself to Him voluntarily. If you give God your all, nothing is left. You can't give God your all and still remain normal. He is a loving Father. It is very interesting to know that God will build a house, which is the church, and He will have to knock on the door of the church to allow Him come in. So is the honor and respect He has for the individual's choice. He respects the free will He has given to us. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. God knows when something in your heart is taking his place. We have to learn to love God in his own language. God is so loving and so kind that he expects us to love him as he designed for us to love him. In John chapter 14 verse 21 it says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Jesus wants love from us that allows him to have access and supremacy over our lives voluntarily. He wants to be trusted as not only Savior, but as Lord. It's only with such heartitude that he unlocks his treasures upon us. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 it says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. All through the scriptures, those who made God their number one lived their lives successfully. Abraham made God his number one. Anywhere God led him, he followed with no complaints. 1 Kings chapter 3 verses 3 to 6 records that, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee 
and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day what does it mean to make god number 1 one to give god your heart my son give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways this is in proverbs chapter 23 verse 26 your passion is an indicator of where your heart is entertainment sports and money are contenders for the space of loyalty in our hearts if your heart is surrendered to the lord you won't be found in any other place when you should be in his presence 2 to make god's objectives your objectives if god is number 1 in your life it will reflect in your participation in church you can't love god and not be radically active in his house your time talents and treasures are channels of expressing your love to the lord 3 to make what gladdens god's heart or what turns the switch of his heart to be also what flips your switch 4 to make god and the things of god number 1 in your life if you seek god first there are certain battles you don't need to fight anymore and there are certain open doors you don't need to open anymore because you are in sync with god's counsel in romans chapter 8 verse 28 it says and we know that all things work together for good to them that love god to them who are called according to his purpose four dimensions to love god in mark chapter 12 verses 29 to 30 it reads and jesus answered him the first of all the commandment is hear o israel the lord our god is one lord and thou shall love the lord thy god with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment one to love god with your heart to love god with your heart is the starting point of intimacy with god the love of god moves you to go deeper into the things of god when you say or pride yourself that you know god it means you don't know god the more of god you get to know the clearer it becomes that there is more of him that you don't know if you're a believer you shouldn't be struggling with the love of god because automatically by virtue of the new birth experience His love has already been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. In Romans chapter 5 verse 5 it says, "And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us." Only true believers have the love of God in their hearts. He loved you when you were not qualified, because his nature is love. In the book of 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 it says, "He that loveth not knoweth not God." for God is love. The totality of real love is God. You are not trying to love God. It is within you. Loving God with your heart implies loving God with your affections. The human nature has the capacity to set the affections or emotions of a man on anything he or she chooses. You can choose to set your affections on something and that moment your feelings go in that direction. When you set your affection on anything, it affects your feelings. As believers, we must set our affection on Jesus as we do so he propels us to live out the love that is already shed abroad in our hearts by the holy ghost psalm 91 verse 14 says because he had set his love upon me therefore will i deliver him i will set him on high because he hath known my name again in psalm 18 verse 1 it says i will love thee o lord my strength 2 to love god with your soul Our souls speak of our personality and one of the ways we express our personality is through our words. You must determine to speak words that further strengthen the love of God in your heart and the hearts of those you speak to. Your soul can be used to quench the love of God within you by uttering words that don't build, words that are provocative and words that are deceitful. Always speak words that heal and build. In Psalm 34 verses 13 to 14 it says, "Keep thy tongue from evil" and thy lips from speaking guile depart from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it you walk in love by purifying your speech james chapter 4 verses 11 to 12 says speak not evil one of another brethren he that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law but if thou judge the law thou art not a doer of the law but a judge There is one law giver who is able to save and destroy who art thou that judgest another to love god with your mind for as he thinketh in his heart so is he 
Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. This is in Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7. Your result here on earth is tied to your mind. Renew your mind with the thought of Jesus daily. Let the word of God guide and direct your thoughts. Meditate on it continually. What you mind is what you find. 1 John chapter 4 verses 18 to 19 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Also in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 it says, But God commandeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 4. To love God with all of your strength. Love him with your substance, ability and all of your strength. The love of God is not lip service. Your commitment, availability and input in advancing the course of God's kingdom goes a long way to reveal the degree of your love for him. Love is giving. Give God your time, strength and substance. Demonstrate your love practically. The End Thank you for listening. Apostle Goodhart, as he's fondly known, serves as the apostolic lead of Horn of Revival Ministry Horn, a global outreach ministry with the mandate to carry the torch of revival across nations. He is also the lead pastor of Revival House of Glory International Church, Rogic, the church expression of Horn, a fast-growing prophetic church with headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. He is a prolific writer with over 30 books, including the classic titles, Revival is Here Again, Catch the Fire, and Living in the Father's Love Zone. Apostle Goodhart is a mentor to many and a well-traveled, astute teacher of God's Word. Passionate about raising a new generation of leaders, he hosts two outreach programs, Bethel Ministers and Leaders Conferences, BEMIL, and winning today on campus, which in over a decade has positively affected several thousands of ministers, leaders, professionals, and young people for the Lord. He is the host of the weekly insightful and inspirational radio program, Winning Today, and the television broadcast, Revival is Here Again with Pastor Goodhart. He hosts the wave-making online Global Prophetic Prayer Altar, GPPA, which airs on www.rogic.radio.org and other media platforms. He's happily married to Pastor Abimbola Ekweme, his life partner and best friend, and they are blessed with three lovely sons and a beautiful daughter. Thank you again for listening. You can contact us at www.rogic.org or on all our social media platforms at Apostle Goodhart.